Right. Um, we'll, um, we're, does, is the legal officer going to do the, the usual spiel today? Yes, please. Okay, let's start with that now. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. This is a brief reminder of procedures and behaviors during the meeting. Could you please make sure that your mobile phones and other devices are switched to silent if they are in close proximity to you? Everyone is responsible for managing their own microphone by keeping it muted unless unmuting when invited to speak. This includes any roll call vote. Following the presentations and members' discussions, members will be asked to vote on each item. Roll call vote is called alphabetically so that it so, so to make it as smooth as possible, please could members be poised in readiness to be called and unmute your microphone before you vote and then mute yourself again afterwards. You are only able to participate in the vote if you have been present at the meeting for the duration of that agenda item. That means by being able to hear and be heard by the chairman. If you should lose visual connection during the agenda item, you are still able to vote, but if you lose audio connection to the meeting, however briefly for that agenda item, you should return a vote of abstain. There may be technical issues with connectivity that, make, that means you leave the meeting unintentionally. Unfortunately, if this is the case, you would have to abstain on the item that you missed part of. To re-enter the meeting, use the Zoom invitation link. If a councillor has an interest and does not wish to attend part of the meeting, the hosting officer will put them in the waiting room and return them to the meeting when the item is finished. Some members of the public are making representations by video recording, which will be played at the relevant time. And members of the public or parish council representatives wishing to participate in the meeting will be held in the waiting room by the host until it's their turn to speak. Should the chairman wish to adjourn the meeting at any time, they will advise that the meeting is to be adjourned and state what time the meeting will be reconvened. All participants are asked to remain in the meeting with their microphones muted. Finally, the meeting is live streamed and you will be seen and heard by members of the public. So it's important to behave professionally at all times. There may be a few seconds delay between the end of the meeting and when the live stream and recording are stopped. Thank you. Thank you very much. I remind everybody that this is a meeting in public, not a public meeting. And you know all the stories about keeping mobiles on mute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, item one, apologies. Do we have any apologies for absence? Um, no, we've not received any apologies. Thank you very much. We have the minutes in front of us from the previous meeting. Can I sign these as a true record to be of course signed at some stage later when we're all together? Any objections to that? It appears there are no objections to me signing the minutes as a correct record. Thank you very much. Item three, the declarations of members' interests. You will have noted we, note we will have one application from a member. I did have a query from other members asking if they have to declare an interest in that they know the members. I said no, unless there's obviously a close relationship or other factors which I'm sure they would want to disclose at that stage. So I therefore go on to declarations of members' interests. Are there any declarations? Yes, Councillor Saeed. Yes, I have to declare an interest in the uh, application in Spinney Lane, West Chiltington. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. You obviously can't participate in that. Exactly. We have to temporarily leave the meeting during the debate. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have no announcements. Do in, uh, do the no. officers or the well, chief executive have any announcements? Into... Sorry? I did actually put in to speak and raise... Oh, the sorry. Uh, Councillor Circus, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to you for pointing out the uh, advice uh, on item 10. I had a, a word this morning with my learned friend uh, because obviously John Blackall and I are... Uh, immediate uh, fellow ward councillors um, and so I thought it was particularly important for us to get um, advice from the monitoring officer uh, and uh, I am advised that uh, 
we do not have, uh, we, we should announce the fact that obviously we are fellow ward councillors, but we do not have an interest, uh, a prejudicial interest such as would deny us the right to speak or vote on this application. Uh, and I intend to do what I always do on every application, which is to give my view uh, irrespective of who the applicant is. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you. And uh, can you confirm that applies uh, the view also, Councillor Blackwell? Chairman, yes, I've, uh, Philip Serkis and I have discussed this matter and we are both of the same view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's, it's not uncommon, obviously, if another councillor brings up an application to some people, perhaps even the public, with due respect, they may think there's a conflict here. But I think the situation has been very carefully discussed out with the monitoring officer and everything is in order. We have uh, Councillor van der Kluch wishes to make a declaration. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to make a declaration in relation to application six. Um, I believe that Councillor Ian Hare, the Chairman of Poolborough Parish Council, is going to speak. And I know him by virtue of attending parish council meetings as uh, Poolborough is in my ward. Um, and I, I don't believe that's a prejudicial interest. Um, I also want to make a declaration in relation to application eight. Um, on Pippin Farm, um, I believe that one of the, I, I used to live um, in this little community at Tote and um, I see that one of the pe people down to speak is Mr. Alistair Abbey and um, although I, I, I moved away 16 years ago, he was one of my neighbours so I knew him from 16 years ago but I don't believe that's a prejudicial interest. Yes, I agree. Does the monitoring officer agree with me? Um, yes, Chairman. Um, in fact, um, Councillor Van der Kloot and I have uh, exchanged emails with regard to this one. So, yes, that, I'm happy with that. Yeah. And also, I agree with uh, <laughs> Councillor Van der Kloot that she does not have a declaration of interest in respect of item six and Mr. Hare. Mm. Okay. okay. It was a super declaration period. Never had such a long one. Anybody else wish to declare? <laughs> That being the case, may we now move on to... Sorry, Chairman, I did. Oh, sorry, did I miss you? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, Councillor Clark. As a parish councillor in, in Polborough, I also have a, a, a declaration of interest concerning Mr. Hare, as he's chairman of the parish council, but I just know him personally, um, and I don't think that impinges on the um, matter at hand. Yes, thank you. Well, I also, yeah, I don't sit in the parish council like Councillor Clark, but obviously know the excellent chairman of Poolborough Parish Council. I think many of us have those types of what look like sometimes declarations because we all deal with, with, with some tremendous parish councillors. And I think that the situation has been very well covered. Okay, right. I see no more hands raised. That's a relief. So if we can move on to item number five. Appeals with the officers, well, no, rather, the appeals are in your bundle. Are there any matters in respect of the appeals, etc., that any member would wish to raise? I see no hands raised, so I presume everybody accepts what's there and has no comments on them. In that case, we'll move on to um, item six, which is DC 28638 land at junction of Hill Farm Lane. And uh, Stain Street, this is the building of four uh, gypsy sites on that particular site. Would the officers like to lead, please? Thank you. At Junction of Hill Farm Lane. And uh, Stain Street, this is the building of four uh, gypsy sites on that particular site. Would the officers Thank you. Uh, this application relates to a parcel of land at the junction of Hill Farm Lane and Stain Street, Codmore Hill, Pulborough. The site adjoins the built-up area of Codmore Hill with residential properties located directly to the west, south and east of the site on the opposite side of Stain Street. Open countryside is located to the north and there are two listed buildings located to the eastern side of Stain Street. 
The site as existing mostly consists of harsh standing with boundary vegetation, although it is noted that some of this vegetation has been removed, particularly with regards to the southern boundary of the site. There are no confirmed historic permissions for the site, and it has been used for a number of years for storage as well as some parking. The site has an existing access point onto Hill Farm Lane, uh, notified just uh, shown just here. Just moving on to some, some pictures of the site. So uh, this is the site as existing, taken last month. Uh, this is looking from the northern end of the site towards Hill Farm Lane, uh, just over here. That's the southern boundary of the site just here. The photo on the right hand side here is looking towards the west. So this is the western boundary of the site with the neighbouring property to the west. And this photo at the bottom here is looking from the southern boundary of the site towards the north, showing existing soft landscaping towards the northern end of the uh, northern boundary of the site. Uh, some additional photos here from outside of the site. So this photo at the top here uh, is just looking from Hill Farm Lane from the west, looking east. Uh, this is the junction with Stain Street, uh, neighbouring property just to the south here, and the site is just here on the left-hand side. And the photo at the bottom is looking from the opposite side of Stain Street towards the site where the entrance is, is just here. So planning permission is sought to change the use of the site for use by gypsies and travellers with the provision of a total of four pitches for the stationing of mobile homes. It is noted that the application has been reduced from six to four pitches due to officer concerns raised with regards to overdevelopment and the quantum of the development in terms of the pitches on the sides. The proposed layout of the pitches are set back from the front boundary of the site. And units one and two, as shown uh, at the front here, will be positioned in line with the prevailing build line of neighbouring properties to the west. Detailed consideration has been given to the proposed layout for which amendments have been sought, and the overall quantum of development is considered to be acceptable for this site. Members are advised that four additional letters of objection have been received from previous objectors, Following publication of the committee report, uh, the additional letters do not raise any matters which have not already been addressed within the report. In addition, members are advised that following the publication of the report, it has, it has been drawn to officers' attention uh, that there are four historic plan applications uh, for the site uh, from the 1980s for housing development, which were all refused by the council. Uh, while this is noted, this is not considered to have a bearing on this current application. Overall, the Council uh, cannot currently demonstrate an up-to-date five-year supply of deliverable sites to meet the current identified need for Gypsy and, for gypsy and Traveller sites, as detailed in paragraph 6.2 to 6.4 of the report. This is considered to be a significant material consideration. The site is considered to be suitable and sustainable immediately abutting the defined mm -hmm. settlement boundary of Codmore Hill, with good links to public transport and amenities and services within the larger settlement of Poolborough to the south. It is noted at paragraph 1.7 of the report that the site benefits from an extant permission for accommodation for gypsies and travellers. Therefore, the principle of the use of this site for this purpose has previously been established. Given, given the current identified need, the intensification of the site is considered to be justified. The application is therefore recommended for approval, subject to appropriate conditions. Uh, just one additional uh, plan to, to show. Uh, during the consideration of the application, um, we sought additional details for, uh, for landscaping. Uh, this uh, shows landscaping to boundary treatments to the west and the south. So this is a landscape strategy, a master plan, of, uh, an indicative proposal at this, at this point, uh, which has been um, accepted uh, by our landscape architect. Uh, however, it's noted that um, there is an additional condition uh, where we'll be looking to secure specific detailing uh, for landscaping, uh, which would include the size of trees, 
along the southern uh, boundary of the site and uh, uh, species and sizing of hedging. Thank you. Councillor Donnelly, I think you're muted. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Say so again, we have nine speakers for this uh, for this uh, uh, council meeting, and we have sit on six items. Uh, the first speaker is Philip Hale, who will speak for two minutes in a video. Codmore Against Rural Decline is a residence group representing the communities of Codmore Hill and Piddingdean. Last year, this committee approved a planning application for a traveller's site on the corner of Hill Farm Lane. Objections then were rooted in the fear this would be the start of a development push by these landowners for this site. The residents are now extremely disappointed to see a further application brought forward for this same site. By applying for six mobile home pitches and then reducing to four, the applicant is giving the impression of negotiation, but what they're actually asking for is a doubling of the intensification of the site, a 100% increase on the permission granted in 2019. We believe the increase in households and traffic that this site would bring can in no way be seen as acceptable. It's not difficult to see that a traveller site of this size could come to completely overwhelm our small community and change the social balance permanently. We believe that by already accommodating two pitches on this site and further pitches in the lanes surrounding us, that it's now for other areas of the district to provide any further capacity. The recent works and cutting back of planting on the site has already given it a harder, more suburban edge to our lane. You can see from the plans just how close this site is to neighbouring properties. Orchard Cottage and the White House are within 20 metres of the proposed site. The officer argues that this distance was found acceptable for the 2019 application. But this application is twice the size. Residents believe there will be a much greater visual impact, noise and disturbance from the proposed site. We argue that the significant damage that this site will cause can in no way be offset by the limited benefit that it could bring. The council's own failure to provide sufficient allocated traveller sites should not be allowed to override the valid concerns of residents here. And this is why today we're asking this committee to reject this application for further intensification of this site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hale. We'll now have uh, Dawn, Dawn Appleton who will Zoom for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman. When this site was last discussed at this committee, the head of development said that this is one of the best sites that has come forward for the provision of gypsy and traveller accommodation. There are many reasons why this site is an ideal location for this use. It is located on an existing underused yard area adjacent to the built up area boundary and is sustainably located in terms of future occupiers travel needs and accessibility to education and health services. The site is not prominent in the street scene, nor located in open countryside, but is well related to existing development, which bounds it on three sides. It therefore makes sense to ensure that the site is used effectively, given the current shortfall of pitches across the district and the difficulties in allocating sites through the local plan process. This application originally proposed an additional four pitches, but the applicant took the advice of officers and reduced the proposal to just two additional homes resulting in a total of four on the site. The revised layout ensured that it retains a spacious feel and from the street scene perspective maintains the two units at the front of the site as previously approved, which is in keeping with the surrounding pattern of development. Good distances are maintained to neighbouring residential properties and a landscape layout has been prepared, which proposes understory shrub and tree planting along the western boundary with Orchard Cottage. Native hedgerows and hedgerow trees are proposed to the road frontage and within the site to enhance rural character and biodiversity. This application proposes development that meets a need and complies with development plan policies that set out the criteria against which windfall applications should be assessed. It makes effective use of an existing site and it is requested that members support the officer's recommendation and approve this application. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now call on uh, Councillor Fulber Parish Council, Ian Hare, who is objecting and he has five minutes and will be speaking on Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and good afternoon, uh, councillors. Um, you've, uh, in, the, in your pack of papers uh, for the meeting, you've got uh, quite substantive uh, um, view of Fulber Parish Councils. So I don't propose to go through that line by line, but just picking out um, some key pertinent points. Um, I'd like to start by talking about uh, national uh, policy for traveller sites, which in paragraph 25 states that local planning authorities should ensure sites in rural areas respect the scale of and do not dominate the, near, the nearest settled community and avoid placing undue pressure on the local infrastructure. By increasing uh, the existing uh, approved application from uh, two uh, pitches to four, with the added um, approval for uh, additional four additional caravans and cars, uh, this will become a site that dominates the small uh, community of uh, Cobmore Hill. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the number of uh, uh, limited dwellings, seven dwellings that are adjacent to, uh, to the site will become dominated by uh, the comings and goings of additional caravans in addition to the existing pitches. Um, I'd like to revert back to what was previously approved and that was for two pitches and a day room. Uh, we note that in the new application, there is no provision for a day room, which would have provided additional facility and service to the, uh, to, to, to the site. Um, this is therefore going to put significant pressure on local infrastructure uh, and amenity, in addition to uh, dominating the rural character uh, of Cobmore Hill. Uh, needless to say, this is also, as pointed out by uh, the, uh, the officer, um, on a crossroads. It's a dangerous crossroads with a 40 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, it's on a hill um, and the thought of uh, transient caravans turning into an out of hill farm lane uh, presents a additional danger. Uh, and inevitably, the extra pressure on infrastructure, including uh, sewerage, uh, uh, rubbish handling, uh, from not only the additional pitches, but also from the transient uh, caravans, um, will, uh, will put that pressure on the local infrastructure as well. Um, I'd now like to talk about um, the... Um, uh, the allocation for, um, uh, for gypsy sites in Horsham District Council um, and the observations that were made by the officer. Um, in the um, Gypsy and Traveller Site Allocation Plan, DPD 2017, um, the document states that the process has identified 68 pictures for use as gypsy and traveller accommodation. It further goes on to say that the uh, requirement for uh, up, up to 2032 is for a total of 78 pitches by 2032. Um, the existing allocation in the 2017 document refers to 53 pitches, which clearly uh, compared to uh, the 78 is a shortfall. However, there was a call for pitches ended August 2019. There has been a further call for pitches ended October 2020. In the call for pitches ended August 2019, an additional 34 pitches came forward, additional to the original 53 pitches. Furthermore, in the call for pitches just ended in October 2020, a further 31 pitches have been put forward and that ignores the five acre site put forward at Five Oaks, which doesn't denote any number of pitches. So by my maths, that's 118 pitches compared to the requirement of 78, 
excluding the Five Oaks site and an excess of 40 plus sites. So the justification on uh, need in terms of uh, uh, there being a shortfall of sites uh, holds no water as far as I can see. Finally, I'd like to uh, finish by uh, commenting also on the um, information that has come to light uh, since the application was put in and is also referred to by the officer um, which uh, was the 2000, uh, sorry, the, the 1980s applications. Um, these uh, applications are recorded on microfiche uh, in the records, uh, as I understand it, um, and they relate to planning applications PL 6883, PL 3088, PL 13989. They were for uh, permanent housing development, and they were turned down as already stated. And the reasons they were turned down was one, the development was outside the village boundary. Two, it was not in keeping with the rural character of the neighborhood. Three, and this is very pertinent, uh, if it was allowed, then it would set a precedent to develop other rural land. And this piece in particular could be extended north into the rural land. Um, that completes my submission on behalf of the Parish Council, and we strongly urge councillors to reject the application. Thank you, councillor here. Would the officers uh, please respond to the comments by the speakers? Thank you. Uh, so just to, just to go through uh, step by step, uh, just in terms of the, the policy position, uh, the 2000, uh, and 17 uh, document referred to has effectively been, been superseded now by the um, Gypsy and Traveller Accommodation Assessment uh, Report, which was produced in January this year. And that confirms that there's, there's a shortfall of 93 pitches. Um, this is the current position of the council and this is accepted also by our planning policy team um, who provided comments on the application and with the previous application last year. Uh, but with this application confirmed that there is that shortfall and there is the need uh, there. Uh, there. Um, uh, with regards to uh, infrastructure, um, I note uh, that highways, highways officers in the first instance um, have been consulted, they've been to site, uh, they've provided um, accident and um, incident information, uh, any potential injuries uh, that may have occurred in the last five years, which, which does not um, um, uh, produce any results in that regard. Um, so the information provided, uh, the evidence available and consideration of the access, which is uh, existing access, which is functioning accordingly uh, with, with, no, with no issues uh, is, is considered to be acceptable. So uh, in that regard, uh, officers were, were happy with, uh, with, uh, with the scheme um, in, that, in, that, in that sense. Um, in addition, uh, if we uh, talk about infrastructure and services, uh, Southern Water uh, have been consulted. Um, they have uh, raised no objections. Um, uh, in terms of the day room in that regard, yes, the day room did provide um, or would have uh, provided um, permanent uh, facilities um, in that regard in, in, in built form. However, um, we have added a condition under Section 7 which requires full details of the mobile homes uh, to be required uh, to be provided, uh, which includes floor plans and elevations. So from the floor plans, uh, we would expect to see full facilities provided uh, within uh, the mobile homes to be stationed on site. Uh, that would include, you know, uh, 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 kitchen and uh, bathroom facilities. Um, and in addition to that, we have added a, a further uh, condition requiring drainage details to be provided. So uh, that uh, infrastructure element should be covered in that regard. Um, in terms of the day room itself, um, whilst this is generally seen on Gypsy sites, it is not a national or local planning requirement for a day room to be uh, provided uh, in support of these sites. Uh, it is also not a licensing requirement either. Um, so, in terms of the quantum of the development on the site, 
uh, the omission the, the, uh, of a day room is considered to be acceptable uh, in that regard, uh, and uh, it would it would result in an increase of uh, one additional structure slash building when you compare it to the extant permission on the site. So again, in terms of the quantum, um, there's a, a, a dual element there. So first of all, that it's not required uh, for policy purposes. And also in terms of the quantum of the development on the site, the omission of a day room um, was considered to be acceptable uh, with the addition of the pictures. Um, I note the comments about the applications for housing in the 80s. Again, um, the policy position uh, in terms of development in the countryside for housing is is would be would be similar uh, as it is today. So that was a housing application um, for uh, a number of uh, uh, bungalows um, throughout the various I think there's three or four applications that were that were referenced. Uh, the policy in that regard is 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 different. Um, housing outside of the built-up area is generally not considered to be acceptable. Uh, but these this application and and the accommodation to be provided is for gypsies and travellers. Uh, and I refer members again um, to the report at paragraph six point five, uh, which references uh, policy twenty three, uh, which is the main policy that we have to consider such applications against. Uh, and it says that uh, such sites should be located in or near settlements. So this is um, right next to the built-up area. Um, we have good connections uh, with a, you know, a pedestrian pavement, uh, public uh, transport links. So in that regard, given the nature of this application compared to the, the applications referred to uh, for housing, um, this is, is considered to meet the, the policy requirements um, in, in, that, um, in that policy. Uh, just in terms of um, proximity as well, um, I know it's the, one of the uh, comments from uh, the video uh, referenced proximity to neighboring properties. Uh, again, I think that would have to be linked back to policy 23 where there is a requirement for essentially these sites to be either located in the built-up area where there is a concentration of, of, of existing dwellings uh, or near to um, uh, existing dwellings, so adjoining a built-up area. So I think that by, by definition of the requirements of the policy, it, it would be, it's, it's normal for uh, there to be residential properties located in close proximity, because that is essentially what the policy is requiring. So I would say that the, the application would, would meet that um, requirement as well. Uh, again, in terms of um, noise and disturbance, uh, amenity is covered um, within the uh, reports. Um, however, it is not considered that the, uh, the, nat uh, the, the nature of the application would be any, any more um, or, or generate any more noise or disturbance than any other residential property um, as they will essentially be used in a, in a similar way. So if you were to, if there was to be a, a, a house on that site rather than uh, the proposal, uh, given the amenity space available um, uh, and you know, the comparison to the neighboring properties, uh, it's not considered that there would be any market difference uh, when you compare to the neighboring properties. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark, as the ward member. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I regretfully do not support this planning application as price. Um, the increase in gypsy pitches from two to now four rather than six is still too dense. I have several reasons for objecting to this application, which I will now expand upon. My first round of objection is based upon NPPF policy item 14, um, basically, which is domination of a neighborhood community. And I quote 14, when assessing the suitability of sites in rural or semi-rural settings, local planning authorities should ensure that the scale of such sites does not dominate the nearest settled community. 
I also quote paragraph 25 of the MPPF paragraph relevant. And again, I quote, local planning authorities should strictly limit new traveler site development in open countryside that is away from existing settlements or outside areas allocated in development plan. This has not been allocated. Local planning authorities should ensure that sites in rural areas should respect the scale of and do not dominate the nearest settled community and avoid placing an undue pressure on local infrastructure. I do stimulate, I do underline dominate. Two gypsy sites are acceptable, barely, in this local context. Where the planning application is located, it is a small community at the extremity of the Codmore Hill area. One could say that two gypsy and travel sites in the immediate community of about 10 to 15 houses might be acceptable. I'm sure to local residents that is not so. The location was acceptable to committee and the principle of two pitches was established and granted. The problem is that within 400 meters of the small community we are talking about, there are another four plus pitches for that minority community. In addition, within a distance of 600 meters, there are two more pitches in the middle of the countryside under appeal where relationships with the neighbors are reportedly poor. In fact, there have been a number of reports to our environmental health officers about issues associated with that location. In addition, within less than 200 meters of the site is an extensive scrap metal business purportedly owned also by a member of this community. The contention that I make is that under this policy of the NPPF effectively, there is a danger of domination of the neighborhood. Two pitches by themselves would seem to be less of an issue to the local community, but imposition of four pitches is a problem. In my view, two pitches too many due to the perceived domination of a small area by a relatively large influx of gypsy and travelers historically and at present. The depth of feeling from the local community can be gauged by simply looking at our website and seeing the very large number of objections to expanding this gypsy and travel site. Now policy 23 has often been quoted as being compliant with the NPPF. And I do recognize that the officer's contention that we do not have a sufficient number of gypsy and travel sites is a strong argument. However, just because we don't have a sufficient supply of sites is not in itself a reason just to approve any old gypsy and travel site, any old place, any old time. It is an easy way out. And it is indeed just one way that we're looking in our new policies that we're debating simply to increase the density of gypsy and travel sites in existing sites. In principle, that might work, but in the context of this community and in this site, it is over intensification. Also, the officer's report is mute on where are the special circumstances to allow one or the applicant to go from two to four pitches. If there are or were special circumstances quoted, explored or given, then those facts would give considerable weight to this argument. However, as I have said, there is no demonstrated argument or arguments proving a true need for this increase. Other grounds for objection include in terms of planning policy, that there is no high quality boundary treatment or landscaping of the site. In fact, one of the boundaries is totally forgotten in the officer's plan, which is along the A29. What is worse is that actually protected trees, as outlined in the report, were cut down with no enforcement action. I refer to the report, paragraph 6.32, that states that despite TPOs, trees were cut down with no action from enforcement. Another issue which the report glosses over is in fact the proposal would have significant adverse impact on the amenity of neighborhood properties both to the side, across the lane and the road. This breaches our policy on in, 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 in terms of, of and our future policy 24 sub paragraph 3 item D. In a planning application that appealed for a site that was 600 meters closer to the center of Cobra, the inspector deemed that the development was unsustainable. That planning application was 09-0488, which Horsham lost at appeal. The site was granted permission because it didn't, we didn't have a five-year land supply, but since then nothing has changed. So technically the site is unsustainable, the officers do not recognize it, but an inspector did. The previous application was for two pitches and a day room. Now the officer says in condition seven that they have tried to cover that angle 
by providing more facility. But the problem is, if you're going to incorporate it in the caravan, you're going to end up with a bigger caravan that will dominate the site even more. So you can't have both. And I'm just concerned that actually, if we grant this planning permission for four pitches with no day rooms or proper facilities, I suspect one, it's a convenient way of getting away, the, getting around the intensification of the site. And if we did agree the planning application, I fear that new residents will suffer from a lack of amenity because I don't think they can get it all into the caravan because the caravans would be huge. But the final point, and I realize that this is not strictly a planning point really, we are all aware that we have a duty to foster good relations with people of protected characteristics. As a ward member, I will draw to the committee's attention that the application technically breaches Article 1 and 8 of the Human Rights Convention. Why I bring this up at this point is simply because officers are using it partly under Item 4.1 as a justification for asking us to pass this application. However, where the write-up of this planning application makes no mention of is actually the human rights of existing local human residents in the local area. Clearly, this is unjust. And why should Pulbra be penalized in this way by an intensification of a site that was already granted for two pitches? These are my reasons for not supporting it. I would ask committee to refuse it. Thank you. Do your officers wish to comment on Councillor Clark at this stage? Yes, head of um, development. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll come. I'm, if I forget a comment, <laughs> do, do ask me again. Um, in officer's view, this is a sustainable site, um, but it's not just the officer's view, it's the decision of the council effectively, because we've already granted permission for two units on the site. So as, as my colleague has pointed out, the council have already established that the site is sustainable um, by granting the previous permission. In terms of whether there needs to be demonstrated special circumstances, Obviously, if they were put forward, that's something we would have to consider. But the particular circumstances that carry significant weight in this assessment is the fact that the council do not currently have a five year housing land supply for gypsies and travellers. That does carry significant weight in our decision making. And as detailed within our policies, part of that um, advises in terms of what types of sites would be acceptable, such as in or near um, to to. Um, uh, built up areas and, and so that forms part of our assessment. Um, in terms of the, the, the day room comment, um, obviously officers have worked hard to, to try and find a solution where the level of development is acceptable. Um, the proposal before you is, is for four pitches without day rooms. Um, we, we can't really make assessment on what may or may not happen in the future if permission was granted here. We have to consider the, the proposal before us. Um, it's not a policy requirement to provide day rooms, although it is generally best practice. Um, you know, my, my opinion is we can't refuse it because they don't contain it and we certainly can't refuse it because they may or may not come in with an application for, for any in the future if we were to grant it. Um, in terms of um, landscaping, um, clearly that's a, it's a key consideration um, uh, that we, we've considered and, and my colleague has shown you a, a, a master plan which demonstrates that a significant level of landscaping can be provided on the site. In terms of the TPOs that have been removed, that's unfortunate and it's certainly something not something that the council would would um, have supported, but but um, you know in terms of enforcement action, um, certainly an um, enforcement team and our tree officer have been involved with this and and considering what the best way forward is in terms of um, their reinstatement. So it, it's not a case that no enforcement action has been taken. Um, action has been taken, but it's not formal action because we're trying to find the best solution for for them to to, to come forward. In terms of dominance, um, uh, speakers and, and Councillor Clark have, have mentioned the MPPF and, and the reference to, to um, dominance. I find that a difficult argument when it's the provision for two additional pitches on, on a relatively spacious site. Um, obviously, that is a matter for the decision makers, but but I think it really is a is a difficult argument, given the relatively resultant small scale of of the Gypsy and Traveller site here. You know, we we have refused applications on that basis before in the district, but for instance, I recall one where it would result in 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 twelve pitches, and 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 that was a consideration. Um, so I I do find that hard. Um, obviously, happy to answer any other questions. Thank you. 
Thank you. Go to the second ward member, the Vice Chairman of Standards, Councillor van der Kluch. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, as we've heard, it's, it's clear um, that given that there's no five year supply of gypsy and traveller sites, that there is considerable pressure on the planning authority uh, for permission to be granted for these non-allocated sites, such as, uh, as this one. I think it's important that we all appreciate, I, I, I certainly had to look into this myself, I, um, as, as to exactly what a pitch comprises. And it, it is land for use by one household, and it can vary depending on the size of the household. Typically, it would be for a large mobile home or a static caravan, a touring caravan, and parking space for two vehicles, possibly a garden area and space for hanging out washing. And as, as we know, th this site was considered suitable for two gypsy and traveller pitches and a shared day room when permission was granted in September 2019. So that would have comprised eight caravans and vehicles altogether and one day room building. And um, looking at the plan for 2019, the day room was to be built to the north of the site, straddling both the pitches with a day room on each side for each pitch. So they weren't sharing communal facilities, they each had their own bit of the building um, dedicated to each pitch. And that comprised a bathroom each and a kitchen and a utility area. And the overall size of the day room was 55 square meters. So um, that's quite a, quite a, 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 a sizable building. So the, the, this application simply relates to the question as to whether the use of the site should be intensified from two to four pitches and there should be no day room, that's gone. So there would be now 16 caravans and vehicles instead of eight and no day room. And I think it's clear that given the plot size, which is just over 0.2 hectares, which I think is about, about half an acre, um, the, these vehicles and caravans would be in reasonable close proximity and certainly much closer than the two pitches in the day room. Now, if we, if we look at the report at paragraph 6.3, and I think it's useful to just remind ourselves of what that says, so paragraph 6.3 um, says, and I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong, the wrong, the wrong page. Um, paragraph 6.3 says, given the identified need and the fact that the council cannot currently demonstrate a five year supply, the principle of intensifying the use of this site is considered to be acceptable, subject to all other relevant material considerations. And I end the quote. Those last words are of course of great importance. So what are the, mater the relevant material considerations here? Well, in the case of, of gypsy and traveller sites, as we've heard, they must comply with policy 23 of Horsham's planning framework. And the report goes through policy 23 and considers all the criteria. And then it goes on to consider other uh, matters such as the suitability of the location, the design, the impact on landscape and listed buildings, neighboring amenities, highways, considerations, trees and ecology. And all those matters were of course also considered when permission was granted in September, 2019. However, there has been one vitally important change in circumstances since September, 2019, which was probably not in anyone's wildest dreams at that time, and that is that we are now living in a global pandemic. And I think that that is so important that it amounts to a material planning consideration, albeit an unusual one. 
Now we might well ask, what, what is COVID-19 to do with planning? Well, the answer is quite a lot and in many different ways. And, and I'll just give you some examples of how COVID-19 has affected planning. In July 2020, the Business and Planning Act 2020 was given royal assent. And in the light of COVID-19, this legislation extended certain planning permissions and extended construction working hours. The government has also, because of COVID-19, made changes to the community infrastructure levy, advised that priority should be given to COVID-related planning applications, postponed neighbourhood planning referenda until May 2021, and given powers to local authorities to hold planning committees virtually like this one we're holding now. So you, you may well then ask, well, okay, but what bearing does the COVID-19 pandemic have on gypsy and traveler planning applications such as this one? And again, I would answer that by saying, I think it has quite a lot to do with it. And this is illustrated by a couple of letters which the communities minister, Lord Greenhalgh, wrote to chief executives of local authorities in April 2020, and again, a few days ago, on the 10th of November 2020. And what Lord Greenhalgh did in those letters was highlight that some members of the Gypsy and Traveller communities are likely to be particularly vulnerable to COVID-19 and may need support in accessing basic facilities such as water, sanitation and waste disposal to enable them to adhere to public health guidelines around self-isolation and social distancing during the outbreak. And I'd like to quote from his April letter. So this is the community's minister. And he said, social distancing or self-isolation may be particularly challenging for members of these communities due to often confined and communal households and restricted living conditions on many sites. It is for local authorities to, to determine how best to support vulnerable groups during this unprecedented period in line with their public health responsibilities. I end his quote. And there, there's other publicly available literature referring to the vulnerability of gypsy and traveler communities to COVID-19. For example, guidance given by the Scottish government, and they said, gypsies and travelers face some specific additional risks and vulnerabilities during the COVID-19 crisis that were important to consider within local resilience plans and which may make it difficult for them to limit virus spread and comply with public, public health guidelines. And these include overcrowding in trailers and between trailers and so on. And similar guidance has been issued by the Welsh government. And, and finally, I just might like to mention an article published by the University of Nottingham Division of Epidemiology and Public Health in June 2020, which highlights the disproportionate impact of the virus on highly mobile populations. Um, they say in their article, the gypsy Roma and traveler population across the continent is likely to be at particularly increased risk of morbidity, mortality, and the psychological, social, and economic effects of the pandemic. Care must be taken to protect this group from novel coronavirus and from widening existing disparities." End of quote. So I, I've gone through that at some length, but, it, but it, the point is that it all points to the COVID-19 pandemic as being an important material consideration in determining this application. Looking at the size of the plot of land, which is the subject of the application, it is very modest. It's not just over 0 0.2 hectares, as a, about half an acre, as I've said, suitable for maybe one detached house or maybe two very small ones. In May 2008, 
the government published a good practice guide on designing gypsy and traveler sites, which states, and I quote, for practical reasons, caravan sites require a greater degree of land usage per household than for smaller houses, and gypsy and traveler sites are no exception. In making comparisons, it needs to be recognized that there is, for example, no equivalent on a site to two or more story accommodation in housing. That's the end of the quote. The guide also goes on to stress the importance of taking into account the health and safety of residents when designing the layout of the site. And it also says very importantly that an amenity building is essential to provide for a minimum of hot and cold water supply, electricity supply, separate toilet and hand basin, bath, shower, kitchen and dining area. It calls it essential. So I think that to summarize, given the current crisis, this is not the right moment to be increasing the intensity of the pitches to four on this site thereby making social distancing and self-isolation more difficult and putting health and lives in jeopardy. And I also have grave doubts about there being no provision of an amenity building or buildings providing for sanitation and washing facilities. Facilities which the government's good practice guide in 2008 on designing gypsy and traveler sites describes as essential. And I think it's even more essential under the pandemic. This council has a duty to protect its community from risk to health from the pandemic at the current time. And that duty must feed into and inform the decision making of this planning committee where relevant as it is here. I, I just want to mention another point briefly. Um, which relates to another important material consideration in considering the application. And that is the environmental objective of the national planning policy framework, which requires development to be sustainable by contributing to protecting and enhancing our natural environment. And I'm looking in particular at paragraph 170, which requires planning decisions to contribute to and enhance the natural and local environment by at little d, minimizing impacts on and providing net gains for biodiversity, end of quote. Now it's well established that improvement of biodiversity is a key means of helping to mitigate and prevent climate change. And the requirement of the NPPF in this regard has to be taken seriously and inform our planning decisions. Now, going back to before September 2019, when planning permission was granted, there was considerable green infrastructure around the boundaries of the site. Indeed, our officer's report in September 2019 referred to the site benefiting from, I quote, extensive mature soft boundary treatments, unquote. And he argued that this lessened the impact on the landscape character of the locality. However, unfortunately, within weeks of the September 2019 permission being granted, most of the green infrastructure was cut down and removed, including, as we've heard, um, a couple of trees which were subject to a tree preservation order. This was despite the applicant's own planning statement relating to the 2019 permission, which stated at paragraph 5.13, and I quote, the site, the subject to this application comprises a yard enclosed by mature landscaping. It is intended to maintain this landscaping, which will not be impacted by the proposed development as it will be sited centrally within the existing yard area, unquote. So that statement proved not to be the case. And I th th there was little that could be done about it um, in, in, in terms of enforcement. However, there is a condition in the planning permission 
um, that was granted in 2019 and would be under this application if granted, whereby the applicant has to produce a landscaping scheme. And I, I understand from what was said by the office at the beginning of this um, hearing that um, a, a landscaping scheme has now been produced. But I would argue that this should provide for at least um, the equivalent to the green infrastructure that was there previously, if not more, in order to create a net gain as required under the MPPF. And that being the case, there would, I submit, be insufficient space for four pitches together with the required reinstated green infrastructure. And that has not been um, taken into account in the report. So I, I'd like to hear what other members of the committee have to say, but I'm certainly strongly minded um, that it would not be appropriate to support the office's recommendation for the reasons that I've outlined. Thank you, Chairman. Would the officers care to uh, respond to Councillor van der Kloof? Yes, Head of Development. Thank you, Chair. Um, ju just with regard to a couple of points, um, the, the 2008 um, Gypsy and Traveller guidance um, was actually withdrawn by the government. So, so I th whilst it, it may have some useful points within it, um, it, it can't form the, 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 the large basis of an assessment because of its, its withdrawn status. Um, in terms of biodiversity net gain, um, you will all know that there's a bill going through Parliament, but it hasn't yet um, gained royal assent. Um, and obviously our um, uh, updated local plan is still going through its progress. So we do have to work on the basis of our, our currently adopted Horsham District planning framework in terms of, of requirements there. And, and that is detailed within the office assessment. Um, in terms of landscaping, um, you know, we, we appreciate it, it is a point of concern and, and certainly something that was considered in depth as part of the officer's assessment. Um, as I said we, before, we, we have got um, a, a, a master plan um, and we have, have a condition there with details to be submitted. Um, and, and what, you know, if, if granted and those details submitted, we would be consulting with our specialist officers with regard to trees and, and landscaping to ensure uh, an acceptable scheme is, is approved. Um, in terms of COVID impacts, um, I, I think I'd find some difficulty here in, in um, raising concerns to a scheme um, due to what what hopefully is is a short term um, short term impact, and we certainly haven't been given any advice from from the government in, in terms of how we should assess gypsy ski, gy, gypsy and traveller schemes differently in light of COVID. Um, but I would just ask for clarification from my legal colleagues um, on that point, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, as the Head of Development has said, there is no specific um, guidance out there with regard to the determination of uh, gypsy and traveller sites at this present time. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the points raised by Councillor van der Klaar, um, it, there, are, that there are issues and, and there is commentary with regard to risk of, of that particular uh, protected um, of those protected people, um, but, but certainly as the head of development has said that there is no guidance out there telling us that we should determine it any differently than, than what we would ordinarily. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Are, are you finished head of development? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. But I see that the cabinet member for strategic planning, Councillor uh, Claire Vickers had her hand up for ages. So I call on her to speak now. Thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you to the officers for the clear explanations on the comments that have already been made. Um, and I'd like to thank Ozan also for his report at the beginning. Um, as members will know, I, this was discussed in great detail last year when the two pitches came before this committee. I remember that debate. It went on for some time. Um, but the principle of um, suitability of the site is now obviously established by that ex extent permission. Uh, much against my chagrin that we don't have a five-year supply of pitches and we're working really hard to rectify this position through our local plan review. But we must take into account that there is already permission for two pitches on this site. It's a shame that the um, 
day room has been removed because I think that would have been a much better application. But as you rightly say, there probably isn't room for four pitches and a day room on that site is constrained. And I do have some concerns about landscaping. And I share the disappointment <clears throat> that the increase in numbers has come so soon after the original planning application. It would have been better if they'd implemented uh, to and shown that they could live in harmony with the local community um, before putting more pitches on there. However, we miss, must deal with what we have in front of us. A question for the head of planning. Um, <clears throat> if we were to refuse this application, uh, would we have to look at a possible temporary planning permission um, going forward before we could actually refuse it? Because I'm just wondering whether temporary permission would be acceptable to members to to show that they that, that this could fit on site and not cause any harm. So I'm asking the head of development to answer whether we would need to consider a temporary permission if this uh, committee was minded to refuse it. Thank you, Councillor Vickers. Um, yes, if if members were minded to refuse this application, if you did not consider that a permanent um, additional pitches was acceptable, then you would have a duty to consider whether um, a temporary permission for two additional pitches would be appropriate. Um, and so that is something we would need to discuss as a, as a committee if we were looking to, to mind to, to refuse this application. I, Thank I you, find Chairman. that difficult to follow. I mean, could you really explain in detail? If we refuse this one, why do they when then have to give temporary permission? It sounds double Dutch to me and everybody else shaking their heads. Well, we, we have crossed the waters against us, Councillor Donnelly, for, for precisely that. So I, I strongly suggest to, to committee that we do. Um, if, if members considered that a permanent permission was not acceptable, um, we should be considering whether whether a temporary permission may be acceptable. Obviously, members may consider that it's not acceptable and, and neither are acceptable. Um, but but we do need to have that discussion. Thank you. OK, right. Uh, Councillor Lloyd's been waiting patiently. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I won't go on, on for for so long because um, Councillor Clark and Councillor van der Kloot put the arguments against this application very well, I thought. And Councillor Vickers also put the um, current position uh, with regard to the extant permission of the two pitches. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I think policy 23C, um, there is no residential amenity space um, as there's no day rooms and I feel that this application does contravene that it's all been explained by the officer but I still feel that we had you know that we have this policy and for some reason it's not being adopted here um, in policy e uh, it's my opinion that the that the development uh, does have an unacceptable impact on the character and appearance of the landscape uh, particularly now that the trees have been taken down on the south side um, and I don't believe because of that, that this has been sensitively designed to mitigate any impact on its surroundings, which again is part of our policy. Uh, my final concern is the expansion of the site uh, through an increase in the numbers of uh, pitches. Um, if I'm right in saying there are going to be eight caravans on this site, not four, there are going to be four static and four touring caravans. And the four uh, un under the condition, I think it's 6.3, uh, the, the um, touring caravans can't be occupied uh, whilst they're on the site. Uh, but I, I just wonder who is going to actually police this. So I do have concerns about it, I must admit. Um, and uh, frankly, I'm sort of uh, minded not to vote for it, but I do understand uh, and agree with what Councillor Vickers stated about the extant permission for the two pitches. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. I've got a few questions to the officers, uh, if I may, and that will help me determine uh, which way I vote on this. Um, first question is, how many Gypsy and Traveller pitches are there on Stain Street uh, between Pulborough and Billingshurst currently? And I'm referring to uh, pitches both with and without planning permission. 
and, and have they taken those numbers into account? That's my, that's my first question, because I think that's very important um, because in this particular part of Horsham District, whether whether you go down through West Chiltington or you come along Stane Street to Pulborough, um, it doesn't seem to, to me whichever way you travel in, there's in the last few years has been an increase in um, activity in terms of converting land into unofficial or official um, sites for various reasons. In fact, I spent most of uh, one day this week behind a caravan being installed in Marindine Road, um, which I don't think had any permission either. So that's the first question. I'm, I'm interested to know if the council actually understand how many of these caravans and, and structures are going in around our district and whether they've taken those numbers into account. Um, the second part was around dominance. It seems to me that this has been slightly brushed aside um, without uh, a, a full explanation because I think, you know, in a democracy, we have to, and we are elected members, we have to take into account the, the views of the um, uh, of our constituents. And we've got 50 letters, I believe, from, was it 44 separate households objecting to this? And if you look through them, it seems quite clear that um, this is the, the main concern is around dominance of, of what's a, a fairly small settlement of Codmore Hill. Um, so the second question is, I'd like to understand... What, what calculation we use in determining dominance on an existing settlement, if indeed there is one, um, you know, and specifically, how many pitches would we accept in, in Codmore Hill before we thought there were too many? Because it doesn't seem to me that we've got that calculation or we understand what that number is. We just kind of say, oh, well, you know, we can't see any specific harm and, uh, and, and then we, we don't have any objection. Um, so that was my second question. Um, and then Councillor van der Kloot did a, a, a brilliant summary of, um, the, of what, what constitutes a pitch, really, because I'm, I'm being asked to vote on this. I don't actually understand what, we're, what, what the application's for. I mean, obviously, I understand it's for a gypsy and traveller pitch, and I understand the difference between the static and, the, and the, uh, the mobile caravan. But what are we actually being asked to vote on? I can't see any any substance in terms of what the structures are. Normally at these planning meetings, we have designers that we can all look at and we can comment on in terms of windows, roofs, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the definition of a pitch? So how many actual structures is it? Is it mobile homes, caravans, static homes, log cabins, or can the applicant put whatever they like on these pitches and, and can they swap them out? So in other words, if somebody puts what a static home on there, what is a static home? Does it have to have wheels? Is it supposed to be movable? Is it a permanent structure or, or does it not matter? I don't understand the legal or the technical uh, considerations there of what, what defines a, a pitch. Um, and finally, I've just got a, a last question around permission on applications. There's, there's two points in the pack that I'm confused about. One's, one mentions human rights and says that there would be um, a benefit, I think it said, um, around human rights. So my first point is, why is that in there? Why are we being asked to, uh, to consider that or take that as a consideration when it's not normally in a planning pack? So does, does local planning law, if you like, have to determine the human right of the applicant? I don't know, because I've not seen it on any previous one. Uh, and the second point was around, um, are we being asked to accept and grant permission on applications that we wouldn't normally accept? Uh, purely because we don't have the five year supply. Seems to me that the council uh, officers are suggesting that we accept this because we don't have a five year supply. And this, came, seems, this, this crops up quite often in terms of planning uh, meetings recently, where we're being asked because we, We've got pressures on numbers and because we don't have this or that, then we should accept it. So my question to the officers is, are we being asked to grant permission on this because we don't have a five year land supply? And if the answer is no, then why is that in there as a consideration? So I'd just like some comment on the, the human rights as aspect and the, um, uh, and the part about the five year, five year supply of gypsy and traveller pitches. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Hi, officers. Um, I'll start, but I but I may draw on the expertise of, of my colleagues as well in, in answering these questions. Um, 
in terms of of pitches in in, in the vicinity um it, it, we, we're we're aware of some in the vicinity that there is a, a site at, at Blackgate Lane. Um, you know, I, I don't have the exact details with me now, and and I think it's difficult to substantiate an argument in terms of objections, um, in terms of pitches within a wider area. I, th I think we do we do need to to consider the localized impacts. Um, in terms of the views of constituents, clearly you know, this is a contentious application as are most gypsy and, and traveler applications, to be honest. Um, obviously the level of objection does, does not warrant an approval or a refusal. We need to consider the comments within those letters um, and how they're relevant to planning as part of our assess assessment. So because of the, just because there is a, is a high level of objection that, that does not give weight to, to, to a decision either way. Um, in terms of, of when something becomes acceptable and unacceptable in terms of numbers, um, it, it's not a, an assessment we would do because each application would be assessed on its own merits. Um, if, you know, in this, in relating to, to your second point about a five year supply, you know, wh when we do our, 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 our site allocations through our, our local plan, we, we would be considering it district wide um, but but we don't have a five year supply and that does carry significant weight and and therefore you know we, we do need to consider these speculative applications when they come before us and to answer your question if we did have enough sufficient allocated sites and this was not an allocated site then we would likely be objecting to it um, but we don't have sufficient sites we have a shortfall and therefore, we need to consider the speculative sites such as this. And there is significant weight that must be applied to the principle because we don't have a sufficient supply. I do hope that answers your question. Oh, in terms of human rights, um, and again, I, I will draw my expertise from my legal colleagues. Um, gypsies and travellers do have a protected status. Um, so we do need to consider that as part of our, our assessment. Um, do, do legal colleagues have anything they could add to that? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it, as the Head of Development has said, um, the uh, Gypsy and Travellers are covered by and protected by the Race Relations Act, but also the Human Rights Act. Um, and, and that is why that um, comment uh, is raised and, and put into the report. Um, they are classed as an e ethnic group and protected by um, that act. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just come Brian, back. You had your questions could, answered. Um, could I just come back there and say, no, yes. I, I totally understand the protected status. I'm very aware of that and, and fully cognizant and compliant with it. I'm, I'm, my question was, um, how does it relate to planning? It's We're being asked to consider that in terms of the planning application. So we should, what, what say, overlook something we would normally refuse as not, not mattering because the human rights overweigh it? How, how are we supposed to use that protected ca characteristic when we're uh, assessing this application? And, uh, when the, and when the officers answer that, there's two sides to the human rights. They're the applicants and also the neighbors. I was just gonna say that there's um, planning policy um, guidance for traveler's sites. Um, and it's, I believe it's a, a 2015 um, document, uh, but if that's something that you that we might need we need to consider in detail, uh, I can try and get that information um, out to you, um, perhaps um, after the meeting, if that's possible. But there is guidance policies on 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 gypsy sites, um, and it that relate to um, to planning. I think the point that's coming out is there's always a balance in the law, isn't there? And yeah. so. Does one party have stronger human rights than another? Or if they have equal human rights, then both cases have got to be considered, surely. I think if I can comment here, here again, it, it, obviously when we write our local plans, you know, we, we consider human rights as part of our policy assessments anyway. Um, and as mentioned by a previous colleague, we haven't got any special circumstances particular to the applicants here, which we might add weight to perhaps in our assessment in terms of their protected status. Our policies, in particular our gypsy and traveller policies, consider that protected status as part of the assessment. So my, my comment on that is, is there's no particular added weight to, to 
to that other than through our, our policies, which which already consider that. And obviously the, the, uh, the officer's assessment of that is, is that the, the scheme before you is acceptable. Thank you. But, but we do have a duty to, 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 to ensure that we demonstrate that we've considered it. Yes, but in the eyes of the law, you know, one human right weighs out another. There's not just human rights for one community, there's human rights for every community and every citizen in the country. Okay, we've had enough of that part. Um, we've got uh, Councillor... Sorry, Chairman, can I just say, I didn't get a, a response on my definition of well, what are we actually... Um, being asked to approve? Is it cabins, log cabins, static homes? Uh, what's the definition? What will it look like? Could, could oh, we get definition some here. Yeah. yeah, sorry, the definition does says that um, it's land occupied by one gypsy or traveler household. Um, households will often have more than one caravan on a pitch. Um, and when I used to work at um, a different council, um, we'd normally go to visit um, certain sites. Um, so you'd have the pitch and you'd have a couple of caravans, um, just like Councillor Van der Klopp was saying. Um, so it probably depends on what site and what they're offering, but um, normally you'd have families or extended families um, and we'd have much more than one caravan on the pitch. Thank you. My, my question was, um, what, what, are we, what are we being asked to... Uh, approved specifically for this for this application how how many how many caravans or or can they put the or can the landowners or or the occupants put as many as they like on i, I don't understand sorry head of development sorry chair if i could just come in come in on that um so the the application is for is for four uh, pitches uh, on each pitch there will be one uh, mobile home slash caravan Positioned. Um, so in the uh, section seven, uh, condition 11, so it says there, there should be no more than four pitches on the site with no more than one mobile home static caravan as defined in the Caravan Sites and Control of Development Act 1960 and the Caravan Sites Act 1968. Uh -huh. so the yeah, so that's the, it has to fall within that definition. Of what a caravan is. Mm -hmm. So there's four um, of, of those on each pitch and there's a maximum of four touring caravans. So they are the ones that can be obviously towed along uh, via a vehicle uh, that can be positioned as well and the, and the site plan shows the parking position for that. It's obviously smaller in scale. Like I said, it's more, more like, a, like a caravan that you can tow, uh, whereas uh, the actual pitches are for maximum number of four uh what we would call more substantial mobile homes as as per the definition okay <laughs> let's move it on now uh, could we have councillor stokers uh thank you very much chairman <clears throat> i thought councillor brown if i understood it correctly and i think i did asked a very very pertinent question um which is that we have the equality act of 2010 which provides uh, for certain people to have protected status. And what we don't understand, what I certainly don't, uh, I'm not clear about, is the extent to which that protected status al alters the assessment on an application. I mean, Emma Park said we took a consideration of that protected status in making our assessment. Well, that's fine, but we're not quite sure, at least I'm not quite sure, exactly what effect that had on the asse assessment. Uh, does it, for example, displace the normal rules that would apply? It would be helpful to have some more precise guidance as to how protected status affects our assessment of an application. Thank you, Chairman. Head of development. Thank you. Um, I think to, just to follow on from that, um, my view is, is it forms part of the assessment, but but that relates to the policies itself. So 
gypsies and travellers have protected status. We have a particular policy within our local plan which considers that protected status and, and how we must consider planning applications. So, so my view is we've only considered it in accordance essentially with our with our local plans because that has already considered the protected status of gypsies. So we're not adding any more weight than we've already allowed through our assessment of our local plan um, when we adopted it. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Vickers. The Chairman, this has been a really long debate and I think the feeling amongst members is that this should be refused um, on um, over dominance of the um, local community. I'm not trying to put words into the local members mouths, but I suggest that's what they're trying to say that this is over development of that particular site, creating a dominance in that area. Um, if we're going to take a vote on it, can, can somebody propose that, please? Uh, Councillor Vickers, I think you hit the nail on the head because the word dominant came up on many, from many of the speakers, uh, Mr. Hale, Mr. Hare. Um, and, you know, the thing that struck me was that we're talking of four sites. Now, those four sites could mean, what, 16 people. Now, I know that's probably not particularly material, but I suspect it could be deemed that. You're then talking of maybe 16 people living on a site which is not really all that big for 16 people. Now, it's, it's just a point. But it, the dominance aspect, I think, becomes through very clear in most of the speeches which were made. And I think also that Councillor Lloyd brought up a very relevant point. He picked up on what the officer said about policy 23, para 6.5 and page 19. The officer read out... Um, a, B, C, D, but he didn't read out uh, para E of 6.5. And Councillor Lloyd correctly brought it up and felt that that one uh, probably fits in well with what the Cabinet Member for Strategic Planning is saying, um, sensitively designed to mitigate any impact on its surroundings. And I think this is certainly uh, an overdevelopment that would mitigate on the neighbours and others. Can I now call on the councillor for Poolborough, councillor Clark, if he would like to put a proposal to the committee? Thank you, Chairman. The sort of thing I have in mind if committee is, is, is to propose to refuse the application that it is in breach of NPPF planning policy for travel sites, power 14, and also breaches our planning policy 23E. And furthermore, and I know that the... Um, had a plan come back on that, but furthermore, there is no demonstration of or evidence of a proven need for the applicant to increase the site from two to four pitches. The way head of development pitched it, it was for us as a council need to increase it. So I'll, I'll just repeat, propose to refuse the application as it's in breach of planning policy for traveler sites, paragraph 14, also breaches planning policy 23E of the HDPS. And furthermore, there is no demonstration of or evidence for a proven need for the applicant to increase the site from two to four pitches. Can I have a seconder for that? Councillor van der Kloch is seconding it. Councillor Vickers? Um, just for a um, point of order, can can the uh, head of development explain if we refuse this, do we then have to consider it as a temporary permission to see if that is acceptable or do we do that before? Um, my view is there should be a discussion. Um, obviously, we've got we've got a motion before us. Um, we should there should be some discussion at this stage as to whether or not a temporary permission could or could not address the concerns that have been raised. Um, I also have a have a point to raise on, on Councillor Clark's motion. Um, I'm not sure the most appropriate time to raise that, Councillor Donnelly. Should Sorry, I raise that? To raise what? Um, so, so there's two points. My view is we should consider whether or not a temporary permission um, addresses the concerns raised now, but I also have some comment to make on the motion put forward. Well, surely our, our protocol is that there's a motion on the table and that motion should be voted on. Legal Beaver. 
Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, we have a motion that's been proposed, um, and prior to seconding, seconding I should say, um, uh, if the Head of develop, Development wants to raise an issue with regard to the motion, we should do that now, Chairman. Okay. The, the other point, Monitoring Officer, is when we should have a discussion as to whether a temporary permission is appropriate. Okay. Um, we... It can be it, it can be dealt with either way. So providing that um, a, a discussion, is, as you have said, and a consideration with regard to temporary has been taken. Um, I know that we've done it um, in previous planning committees um, where we've taken the motion for permanent first um, and gone through a second vote with regard to temporary. But uh, providing that the, the, the temporary position, uh, permission has been considered then um, again, it would it would be up to the, the chairman, but, but we would need to make that note and it, and it would need to be minuted that that has happened. Preferably, um, a, a second vote uh, could be taken. You say a second vote could be taken on a temporary? It, yes, it could. Yeah. It, it, okay. it's, it's a better way of minuting yeah. that okay. the consideration yeah. that, that's fine, has been it? made. Okay, I think we're all happy there. Okay. We have a motion then in front of us from Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor van der Kluch and the Chairman. Sorry to interrupt you. I think head, sorry. Can I, sorry to interrupt you, yeah, yeah, Chairman. On. Another point of order. I think the head of yeah. development wanted to say something about the possibility of the reasons for refusal. I would be more comfortable if it was on the dominance um, in the area, if possible, without the other policy objections. But I'm sure the head of development has got something to say on that. Okay, head of development. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, please. Um, obviously, in terms of, of whether the, the development over dominates the site or not, um, you know, officers have, have expressed their view that it doesn't, but but that, that decision really is is with, with you as decision makers, and obviously that motion has been put forward. Um, in terms of a proven need, um, I have significant concern about that being a reason for refusal. It's not about an individual site here. The council has a lack of a five-year supply of, of gypsy and traveller sites. It is a district-wide matter, and that forms part of the assessment. So I do have significant concern if that were to form part of a reason for refusal. Thank you. I think the five-year supply of land was raised by one of the speakers. And made, made it very clear that the council has failed in its duty to produce it. We have all failed. It's as simple as that. Nevertheless, the planning inspector is a very far-sighted person, and he won't just take that as the only reason. I think there's several reasons already been mentioned tonight. It is tonight. It's getting dark, I suppose. And I thank the cabinet member for strategic planning for bringing back that dominant factor. I think the dominant factor is a very strong position. So, following on from that, um, I suggest that. Can I point yeah, of yeah. order, please? Yeah. On a point of order, the reason, just to explain why I included that, is simply because when I have read um, appeals, planning appeals, with our, sorry about the noise, um, through appeals to do with our planning policies, um, basically one of, the, one of the grounds that we have lost planning for in the past is because. We didn't, there was no demonstration of a proven need. And we lost several appeals on that ground. Um, I'm quite happy for the head of development to correct me. Sorry about the noise. Well, if you're insistent on that, which is your right, but I think, can you build in something about the dominant factor of the application as well? Yes, Chairman. The point was that. Um, the reason why I referred it specifically is that because paragraph 14 of the planning policy for traveller sites does quote the dominant, um, says when assessing the suitability of sites, etc., etc., local planning authorities should ensure that the scale of such sites does not dominate the nearest settled community. So it's very, stated, very plainly stated in policy C, paragraph 14. Okay. I think we've had enough of that, and I presume Apologies. Councillor van der Kluch seconds that still in that uh, circumstances. You're still seconding that, are you, Councillor van der Kluch? Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Yes. That's okay, we all do. Yes, I'm, I'm Jim, okay. thank you. Thank you. Okay, that being the case, could we now go to the vote?
Yeah, okay, so this vote is for the refusal of this application um, for the reasons as set out by Councillor Clark on its overdominance of the surrounding area and contrary to paragraph 14 and 23E of the HDPF and that there is no need for the applicant to increase the number of pitches. So Councillor Blackall. You're muted, John. Sorry. Against. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Oh, just to clarify, we're voting for the motion put forward or? Yes, you're voting on the motion for refusal of this application. Or. Thank you, Councillor Chowan. Or. Councillor Circus. For. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Croker. Four. Councillor Dorr. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Jupp. Against. Councillor Kitchen. Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Lambert. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Lloyd. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Platt. Four. Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Rowbottom. Four. Four. Councillor Said. Four. Councillor Sanson. Four. Councillor Vanderkloot. Four. Councillor Vickers. Abstain. And Councillor Wright. Four. Thank you. So that is 18 votes for the motion, two against and two abstentions. So it has been refused. Right. Now, the officer said we have to put up a motion vis-a-vis -vis temporary. So who's going to propose this motion if nobody wants to propose it? Yes, Claire. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I, it's for the committee to decide whether a temporary permission would be acceptable. We have to discuss whether it would be acceptable if we gave a two-year temporary permission. Does anybody want to initiate such an exciting... We have to consider it, don't we? Well, why don't we just vote on it? That's the simplest way, isn't it? Well, I have to propose it and somebody has to second it, Chairman. But that's the interest, it's an oxymoron here. It, you know, it look, doesn't look like anybody's rushing forward to propose this. So how do we... Well, move we have to... I think we've lost appeals where we haven't considered a temporary permission may be acceptable. So for that reason, we have to consider it. So I'm proposing we consider that we give a two year temporary permission. Okay, fair and enough. And somebody could second that. We can vote well, we against it, but we yep. need to consider okay. it. Thank you. I'm happy to second that. There's Thank a dozen second it. Councillor Lambert and da da da. Okay, we have now another motion on the floor. The motion is to provide a temporary permission. Does anybody want to talk on this at all? Oh, I've got some hands up. Councillor Wright. I'll make this very short. Um, it, it's not appropriate to have a permanent permission and it's not appropriate to have a temporary permission because you are imposing the same issues that a permanent permission does, but for a temporary period. And I bet you at the end of that temporary period, it becomes permanent. So uh, I will be voting uh, uh, yes. against this, um, uh, uh, this, this proposal. Thank you. We've got Councillor Rowbottom. Thank you. I would agree entirely with what Councillor Wright has just said. Um, if they get on that pitch, we will never get them off. Right, thank Councillor, you. thank you very much. Councillor Clark, now we're going to have a break after this. You can all feel assured. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, the point I was going to ask is can it be expanded upon if we put a sunset clause, so to speak, on a temporary planning permission, how does one make it watertight? You can't. You can't. It's full of holes. Right. Let's go to a vote now, please. So the vote is on a temporary planning permission for two years. Thank you. Yes. So this vote will be for granting a temporary planning permission of two years instead of the permanent one as set out in the application. Uh, Councillor Blackall. Against. Councillor Brown. Against. Councillor Chowan. Against. Councillor Circus. Against. Councillor Clark. Against. 
Councillor Croker. Against. Councillor Dorr. Against. Councillor Donnelly. Against. Councillor Jupp. Against. Councillor Kitchen. Against. Councillor Lambert. Abstain. Councillor Morgan. Against. Councillor Lloyd. Against. Councillor Noel. Against. Councillor Platt. Against. Councillor Potts. Against. Councillor Rowbottom. Against. Councillor Said. Against. Councillor Sanson. Against. Councillor Van der Kloot. Against. Councillor Vickers. For. And Councillor Wright. Against. Thank you. So that is one vote for, 20 against, and one abstention. So that motion has failed. Right. We'll now, if you don't mind, take about a five minute adjournment for uh, Councillor Clark to go and feed his starving dogs. And we'll be back in so roughly 16. Can't read much. So let's say we'll be back at quarter past four, okay? Everybody. Thank you.
Right, we seem to be missing a few people still. Maybe they all had dogs to feed. Yeah, that's why puss number short in Cobra, because the dogs eat them. That's because you've got about 20 dogs. Only four. <laughs> We're still live streaming, are we not, Chairman? I hope so. Yeah. Were you suggesting conversations about dogs were not appropriate, Claire? No, I didn't say that. I just thought we'd better be careful in case somebody says something they wish they hadn't. Dogs are fine. We all love dogs. Me, me especially. We do. Right, we, we better get started then. Uh, would the officers care to introduce the application? Hello, good afternoon. So uh, I'll be doing the uh, the rest of them. Thank so you. So if you just uh, bear with me while I get the screen up. And this is uh, agenda item seven, erection of two new three bedroom semi-detached dwellings, Westland Farm, Billingsis Road, Ashington, the Ward West, Chiltington, et cetera. Oh, there it is. Shall I go? Okay, Thank you. so yeah, as the chairman says, an application for the construction of a pair of semi-detached houses adjacent to an existing house, uh, recommended for approval. Here we see the location plan. The site is located off Billingshurst Road north of Ashington in a countryside location adjacent to Sussex Equine Hospital. And on this plan, I've um, highlighted the existing dweller, dwelling and a barn with prior approval, which is a part of this site and a consideration. Some pictures here. So this is a view from Billingshurst Road. You can see the existing house to the right there set back. Uh, and uh, to the left there, you see the barn, which uh, benefits from the prior approval for two dwellings. And this slide is a bit dark, I'm afraid, but it's within, more within the site and you see the position of the proposed pair of semis adjacent to the existing house. Uh, this is the proposed block plan. You can see the proposed pair of semis alongside the existing house with parking in front. And uh, you can see here in the dotted in red is the buildings to be demolished, which includes the building, uh, the barn at the front, which benefits from the prior approval. Here we see the proposed elevations. So. Um, pair of semis as you can see here with brick and timber cladding with timber windows in a traditional style. This is the prior approval which has already been granted for the conversion of the barn at the front of the site. It's pertinent to this proposal as this scheme has been put forward on the basis of having the full back position of the prior approval for these two dwellings. So I thought it was relevant to show this. And this final slide shows uh, the dwelling in the context of the uh, existing dwelling on site. As I said, they'll be side by side. So as you'll know, this is a departure from the local plan for a dwelling in the countryside. The proposal is recommended for approval on the basis that it has a realistic fallback position relating to the extant permission for the conversion of the barn to two dwellings granted in 2019. This fallback is given significant weight in the consideration of this proposal for a pair of semi-detached houses. As outlined in the reports, the pair of semis is considered a more preferable option than the two dwellings on uh, than the two dwellings that have been approved as part of the prior approval, both in terms of visual amenity and uh, their impacts on the uh, surrounding area. So, on that basis, the application is recommended for approval as outlined in outlined in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no speakers for this application. I'll now go to the ward members. I'll start with the cabinet member for the environment, Councillor Circus, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Um, I frankly think that the Parish Council, Ashington Parish Council, has put the arguments against uh, approving this application this afternoon very well. It is, as we've just heard, a departure from the local plan. It's uh, outside the built-up area. 
it's not in the emerging neighborhood plan, the Ashington na emerging neighborhood plan. I'll say more about that in a moment. It's in a rural location outside the built up area. And it cannot be said that this development is essential to uh, a countryside, to this countryside location or any countryside location, uh, which I thought was the fundamental test as to whether uh, a countryside location outside of the build, built up area uh, was, was the fundamental issue. Um, now, uh, I, I know the officers uh, don't like giving any credibility to uh, emerging neighborhood plans. And if the government had their way, they, they wouldn't give any, uh, any weight to neighborhood plans, period. Uh, but the fact is we believe in neighborhood plans uh, because we're uh, local politicians representing local communities. And these neighborhood plans are emanations of the communities we represent. And so uh, I think we should uh, respect uh, the fact that this is not uh, uh, in the emerging neighborhood plan, which I, I ought to say is at an advanced stage. Uh, we, we know we, we cannot move to a local referendum at the moment because the government has pre prevented uh, parish councils doing that uh, during the current COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but it is at an advanced stage uh, and I think we should, it's a point I've made on so many occasions now, that as local councillors representing local communities, we should give a lot of weight to the hard work that our parish councillors and others put into the development of neighbourhood plans. A lot of effort has been put into the Ashington neighbourhood plan. There has been considerable unhappiness in Ashington um, because of the threat of a massive number of houses uh, uh, that they weren't expecting. And that has, uh, to some extent, undermined their enthusiasm uh, for working on their neighborhood plan. Uh, and as local councillors, we have had to do quite a lot to bolster uh, continued involvement by the parish council in Ashington in moving forward with their neighborhood plan. And I, for one, am going to support uh, uh, the parish council in Ashington um, uh, and to show that we really think, I think, and I hope most members will feel that supporting our parish councils, supporting them in the work they do on neighborhood plans is important. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Councillor Blackall. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, like Councillor Circus, I do think we have to give weight to all the work that's been done in Ashington on their uh, neighbourhood plan. Um, both the clerk and the chairman have taken a lot of flack over many months uh, to get to the state they are. And if it wasn't for the pandemic we have at the moment, I think it would be coming to a referendum. And this is, you know, they object to it. I do feel that um, uh, my first duty in this is to support the parish council on this, uh, because otherwise it completely undermines all the work they've done and really brings this type of democracy into disrepute. So I will be voting against this proposal. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Saeed. Thank you, Chairman. I myself am in, in agreement with that. Um, I think the, the, the plan is, um, the building is in, is, is, is in, in, a, in a outside the building area. And I think I ought to support the council as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll vote against it. Thank you. Thank you. All this does remind me of when we were doing the governance committee review for the creation of the small professional planning committees where some parties were saying we've got to take the district's position in mind. Anyway, we'll come back to that another day. Um, would the head of devel development like to comment? I see the hand up and then I'll pick up Councillor Vickers. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just, just wanted to, to remind members as to why this application is put forward. 
um, as my colleague said, this application is put forward on a fallback position because the permitted development rights, um, national rights, have allowed the conversion of a barn to residential. Therefore, the, the principle of residential development on this site has already been established. Even a made neighbourhood plan would not change that position because the permitted development rights fall outside of the, the development plan, which includes neighbourhood plans. And, and our own plan, which obviously resists um, development in the countryside. So it's not, at, it, well, essentially is at odds with neighbourhood plans, but but that's the way permitted development works. Um, and and that needs to be given considerable weight in our assessment. Thank you. Councillor Vickers. Thank you, Chairman. Well, the uh, Head of Development has just explained exactly the position we're in. I mean, these fallback options are always very complicated. And I actually think that the proposal is better than what they can build without planning permission. And I think I thank uh, um, the head of development for explaining that this falls outside of anything in the neighborhood plan. The fallback per permitted development is already established. So if we refuse this, they can still go ahead and convert those buildings into two dwellings. I think this proposal is better than what they can do under PD and therefore I should be supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. I thank the two previous speakers for clarifying that matter and the strength of the fallback plan position. Councillor Wright. I, I, I thank you, Chairman. I do have much sympathy with um, the local ward members and the parish council because often it does feel like we have these meetings only to, to, to decide on the planning application, only to be told that even if we do decide something, it doesn't really matter because, you know, there's already going to be housing, housing's going to be built there. So I do have a lot of sympathy. I will just say that this particular site, to call it outside of the built up area seems a bit farcical because um, if you go back to the uh, site plan that the planning officer shared, there is three acres of asphalt and riding um, area right next to the, the site. So it's not like this is countryside. Actually, in fact, this um, uh, particular houses are being built between an existing dwelling and the three acres of um, tarmac um, riding facilities and um, barn. So I, I don't quite, I mean, I, I, it is outside of the Ashington area, but it's not like it's rural countryside we're building two houses on. However, I do sympathise with, with what the parish council and the local ward members are saying. Right, we have councillors Noel Morgan and Jupp. Robarton's just sneaked in and councillor Robarton will be the last speaker. So councillor Noel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have every sympathy for the parish council, but I would agree that there are no um, specific planning rules which are going to stop this application from being approved. Um, the problem is that it's, it's yet again um, an example of what I would call um, planning creep, where a developer will, um, I'm, I'm not saying this in this case, but quite often a developer will, will get permission for um, a conversion of an agricultural building under a class Q, and then use that to um, get another permission um, under uh, the rule which allows them to demolish one building and build another. I have to say that actually the new scheme is of much better appearance and uh, I, am, um, I am regretfully um, going to uh, vote to um, allow, uh, allow this development to go through. But I would just want to make the point that permitted development appears to be um, just abused by developers and uh, allowing, and, and, and it is, it's allowing this, this planning creep of getting one permission and then using that as a fallback and putting something else in a different position. And I just think it's wrong, but that's the planning law. And as I said, unwillingly, I'm going to uh, vote to approve this one. Thank you very much. Right. We'll briefly go through the next three. Councillor Morgan, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, my concerns are very much like uh, Councillor Noel. I mean, it, it concerns me that we're getting more and more of this type of application 
where we're told that it's preferable to accept the application because the fallback position is a worse design and that therefore we have no option but to agree it. And we would not normally be approving this type of application for a development in the countryside as it goes against our policies. Class Q was surely to admit barn conversions, not new houses. I'm not convinced that we will be making the changes that we are being asked for and that we should rely on the original permissions. Well, the Trojan horse concept, I think, has been going for a long, long time. And, you know, you might argue or you seem to be suggesting that's the case here, but that's by the buyer suspect. Councillor Jupp. Councillor Jupp, you're muted. Councillor Jupp. I urge my colleagues to heed the wise words of our cabinet member for planning and development, uh, Councillor Vickers. Is that all? Well done. Councillor Rowbottom. <laughs> Thank you. That was a surprise. Um, what will happen to the barn Does if we um, approve the new application? Will it um, just stand there as a barn or will it have to be demolished? Um, somehow, to me, a barn that's been there for many years is part of the scenery, even if it's converted into flats, is better than two stark new brand new houses in the middle of the countryside. Thank you. Officers. Uh, yeah, I can come in. So uh, there, there is a condition requiring the demolition of the barn. So uh, that would offset the two houses so you wouldn't get four dwellings on the site. So they'd have to comply with that condition. And um, we feel it's the, the two houses is put forward as a, as a more benefit for the site. It'd be visually better, it's more set back and it's, it gives better accommodation than the barns would. They would have their own gardens and amenity space, which you wouldn't, wouldn't get with the barns. Thank you very much. We'll now go to the vote. Officer Gubwell. Thank you. So this is a vote for the officer recommendation, which is to approve planning permission subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Councillor Blackall. Against. Thank you. Councillor Chowan. Oh. Councillor Circus. Against. Councillor Clark. Abstain. Councillor Croker. Abstain. Councillor Dorr. Or. Councillor Donnelly. Or. Councillor Jupp. Or. Councillor Kitchen. Or. Councillor Lambert. Four. Councillor Morgan. Yes. Councillor Lloyd. Four. Councillor Noel. <laughs> Say again. Sorry, sorry Councillor Noel. I keep getting interrupted. Four. Thank you very much. Councillor Platt. Four. Councillor Potts. Against. Councillor Rowbottom. Against. Councillor Said. Against. Councillor Sanson. For. Councillor Van der Kloot. Against. Councillor Vickers. For. And Councillor Wright. For. Thank you. So that is 12 votes for, seven against, and two abstentions. So um, planning permission has been approved. Is that yours now or the next? Thank you. We now move on to agenda item eight, direction of a temporary farm office, Pippin Farm. Would the officers like to lead? Okay, let's get the presentation up. Okay, can you all see that? Yep. Great. Okay, so it's an application for retention of a farmhouse and as a temporary permission. This is a South Downs National Park application. Here we see the site it relates to Pippin Farm located off Tote Lane within the South Downs National Park, north of Pulbra, adjacent to existing dwellings, which you can see there. This is a bit more of a close-up of the, the layout plan. You can see existing barn, the existing farmhouse to the south and the proposed farmhouse there up to the north. And we have a, a, a detailed layout plan. You see the proposed farm office here, which is a relatively modest building in the north part of the site. Um, and you can also see, see here the permitted uh, outline of the consented garage with an office, uh, which hasn't been implemented yet. This is put forward on the basis of a temporary permission 
uh, until the office has been built or up for three years, whichever is the, the soonest. And here see the elevations of the office, as I said, is a modest building, timber clad. And uh, we can, as outlined in the report, it's not considered to have a significant impact on the immunity of adjacent properties and considered visually appropriate for a temporary period. And this is, as I said, this is a, um, a regularization. So it's, this building is in place and this picture shows uh, the building as, as, um, as placed on site. Uh, so the, rec the recommendation is for a temporary permission um, as outlined in the report. Thank you. Thank you. We have four speakers. Could we hear from William Hawkin, who's coming by video and is objecting? I'm William Hawkin and I live at Toe Cottage. Despite the wide ranging report, there are still some significant questions remaining, and on this basis, I object. Despite the pre application, the use or evolved use of existing buildings has been omitted. The old fruit farm office was contained in the old barn and the previous owners used one of the four bedrooms. There is still extant permission to build a domestic garage and office that was approved prior to the installation of the temporary containerized structure. So this building was erected without permission despite other options being available. There is no explanation of proportionate size for the building. In reality, perfect agricultural use is contractorized over two to three fields with a small flock of sheep and some hay. This probably means that management can be achieved over the phone. Any record keeping would be contained within IT or a small filing cabinet. Others working at home manage within one room of, say, 12 square metres, frequently much less. So why a building with floor space of about 50 square metres is required as yet to be justified? Since compliance advised that use by Scorpio was not allowed, the building has seemed to be empty, so why is it actually needed at all? And although the building is fenced from neighbours, there are three windows and a rear door that overlook the neighbouring gardens. This imposes on our privacy and on child safeguarding. The building contains a kitchen and WC facilities. The report is vague on whether soil water and rainwater is discharged. I contend that there is no proper drainage apparatus installed to which this soil water is connected. This is an important health and safety and environmental issue that must be addressed. Under conditions, in brackets, or the use hereby permitted discontinued would allow the building to remain in place despite the clear intention for it to be removed, which at the latest should be from the date of the planning approval for the garage block. I ask for the words in brackets to be removed and the amendment made for the avoidment of any doubt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. We'll now hear an objection written statement from Carl Sturg Nell. -Nell. Would the officer care to read it? Um, as the owner of Aaron Way Cottage, I object to the application for the temporary office. My wife and I purchased Aaron Way Cottage in 2005 and the land line to the south of the cottage. Stating that the office has little impact on our cottage and being over 20 metres away is therefore incorrect. The office is sited just over a metre from the 1.8 metre closed boarding fence erected by Mr Gaffney. The office is intrusive to the landscape and our privacy. Since Mr Gaffney purchased Pippin Farm, the landscape and levels have changed dramatically. Living in South Downs National Park prior to 2017, we are secluded by trees and we were secluded by trees and vegetation on both of the boundaries. These have since been removed and the levels raised. With large retaining walls built, our privacy was impacted with those in Pippin Farm standing on raised ground and able to watch activity in our garden. The raised land and significant introduction of hard standing has also had a huge impact on the water drainage into our, into our property, leaving our lawns and drains driveway boggy. We are concerned that the soil water from the office, as we are unaware of any cesspit or sewage mechanism to which the office is connected. An application was made for a garage office by Mr Gaffney in 2019. This was approved in July 2019. Whilst we were on holiday in August 2019, the temporary office was installed. My wife raised her objection directly to Mr Gaffney and at that time, at that time, and he advised it was just a temporary measure for his business Scorpio alarm, as he didn't want to, to as he didn't want to, um, to, to, to drive to the office in Shoreham. Since its installation, it was used for that purpose. 
I struggle to understand why he is saying that the reason for this building is now for the farm, as there is very little farm activity of which you have been provided evidence by several neighbours who are witness to the activities at the property. If the permission for the garage farm office approved in 2019 expires in 2022, shouldn't this be the deadline? Thank you. We'll now hear an objection representation from Alistair Abbey, which is coming by video. Good morning, my name is Alistair Abbey, and I'd like to mention a few breaches of planning laws and building regulations at Pippin Farm. Firstly, the temporary office was erected in August 2019 without planning permission being granted. Secondly, Scorpio Security Services, a company owned by the applicant, used the temporary office for its business operations, contrary to agricultural tire restrictions attached to this property. Subsequently, this has been corrected after an investigation by Horsham District Council. The new approved office, despite being approved in June 2019, still has not been erected, so why is that? Thirdly, a large Clarchester unit capable of servicing a six-bedroom house was purchased many months ago. Neither the Environment Agency nor Horsham District Council's Building Regulations Department was consulted over its installation until the applicant was questioned about it. What is the purpose of such a large unit when it is intended to serve as one toilet and one sink in the new office? Also, the discharge path of the new unit is questionable under the current Environment Agency regulations. The entire agricultural activity at Pippin Farm appears to be subcontracted for both sheep and hay. So what is the purpose of this temporary office? In summary, I'd like to say that the applicant is entitled to seek permissions he requires, so long as this is done in accordance with the current rules and regulations, but any manipulation, ignorance or abuse of these rules is simply not acceptable. Considering the scale and cost of development of Pippin Farm is well in excess of that required for a small agricultural holding. So what is the real agenda? And finally, we move to this area because it lies within the South Downs National Park, offering the highest protections under government rules. But we believe these rules are, being, are not being enforced, and we look to the planning department and the planning committee to uphold and preserve these rules. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abbey. And the final representation is um, from the agent, Dawn Appleton, who will be coming by Zoom. Thank you, Chairman. I'm speaking on behalf of the applicant, Mr Gaffney, who would firstly like me to pass on his thanks to the planning officer for the thorough report which sets out the planning matters to be considered in this case. Pippin Farm is a small agricultural holding with an agriculturally tired dwelling that was purchased by the applicant in early 2017. It was formerly a fruit farm, but with trees removed around 25 years ago, it can only realistically be used for hay production and grazing. It is these activities in which the applicant is legitimately engaged, having taken a hay crop each year and is using the land for the grazing of agricultural animals as well as his own horses. The planning authority has supported this agricultural use by granting permission for a purpose-built hay building, as well as allowing a farm office above a new garage. This application merely proposes the retention of a small building that is being used as an office with toilet facilities to serve the current needs of the holding. It will be removed once the new office is constructed. Despite it being only a temporary arrangement, the applicant has sought to ensure that it is appropriate to its context by cladding it in timber. The applicant could have chosen to use a caravan or other temporary structure, which would not require planning permission, but is keen to ensure that the office and future approved buildings are built to a high standard of design and are well sited. The objectors make reference to the applicant's other non-agricultural business interests, but these do not take place from the site and should not influence the decision on this application, which must, must be judged on the needs of the holding and assessed in the context of the extant permission for an office on the site. Reference to other matters such as traffic and impact on adjoining residents are dealt with succinctly in the officer's report, and it is agreed that this small farm office will have little impact on those matters. The Parish Council has not objected to the application and your officers are recommending approval for a temporary period. It is therefore requested that members agree the recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a question for the monitoring officer in respect of Councillor van der Kluck, who is a member of the South Downs National Park. 
we've had it before, that is participation in uh, South Downs National Park application. Is there a conflict here at all? Thank you, Chairman. Um, provided that uh, Councillor van der Kloot feels that she can make a decision uh, based on the planning merits and her position um, on that, um, the National Park and representing the National Park um, doesn't stop her from doing so, then she's absolutely okay to, to go ahead. Uh, again, it, it's within her gift and, and it's her decision. But um, as, from what I can, can tell, um, I would say that, that she, she probably is okay. Again, okay. she would she would need to confirm that, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Van der Kerf. Yes, well, I I feel uh, entirely happy um, dealing with the application, um, and obviously we'll be applying the um, policies of the South Downs local plan. And I have I have no qualms about um, about uh, being a member of this committee to yep. hear the application. No, okay, just just you know ticking the transparency box so that nobody can come back to us. Would you like to now make a representation on behalf of the ward, Councillor van der Kluch? Yes, thank, thank you, Chairman. This is an application for development in the South Downs National Park. And as our report reminds us, national parks are afforded the highest status of protection under planning law, and great weight should be given to conserving and enhancing landscape and scenic beauty. To be able to carry out development in the park is therefore really something of a privilege and any development should be of a very high standard and landscape led. Um, now we can see from the report um, on the page 46 that there's been quite a considerable relevant planning history here and I did raise with the officers before this um, application before the hit this hearing, I should say, this committee, um, that a couple of um, planning applications which are relevant to the history have been omitted. And they did say that um, they would draw the, the, those to the attention of the committee. Um, and that was omitted just now. So I'll just mention those. In addition to the ones we can see in the report, um, there was also an application granted, permission was granted to extend the house, Pippin Farm, which is a, a bungalow, um, and that was in um, 2019. And in 2020, permission was granted in September for an extension and repositioning of the existing stable block by just over 50%. That was one of the buildings we saw on the plan and the um, the, the um, permission that was granted for the, or, the garage office will be next to that building. So, um, as I said, the permission was given in 2019 for the building of a four bay garage with an office in the space over it. And by condition, it's to be used solely in connection with Pippin Farm which is a tied agricultural dwelling, that is the bungalow. Historically, as we heard from the agent, um, the 23 acre farm had apple orchards, as the name suggests, but 30 or so years ago, the EC, as it then was in its wisdom, paid farmers to plough up orchards, and that was done here. Agricultural activities, we're told now, comprise haymaking and the grazing of a small flock of sheep. To my mind, it is highly questionable whether there was or is need for an office to provide the wherewithal to administer such minimal agricultural activities. Um, I think that administration has in the past, as I think one of the speakers mentioned, been carried out at Pippin Farm, I in the bungalow, in one of the rooms there. And that bungalow is now in the ownership of the applicant. But anyway, that is history as planning permission was given in July 2019 for the garage office. And that's to be built between the existing stables for which permission has been recently granted for an extension, as I just mentioned, and an old storage barn, which I presume was for, for apples in, in days gone by, thereby increasing those buildings from two to three 
within that little enclave, which is just to the north of the bungalow Pippin Farm. And there was to be no external lighting on the garage office for which permission was granted in 2019. Now, having obtained that permission, as we've heard from one of the other speakers, a month later, the applicant then set about creating an office on his land, not in accordance with that permission, but of a totally different style of building in a totally different location. And um, that he's now seeking retrospective permission, albeit a temporary permission. So what are the implications of its being described as temporary? Well, we're told by in the report that it could last for a maximum of three years, which is quite a long time. Now, there's no reason, as far as I'm aware, why this application should be considered more leniently under planning law than any other application, just because it's described as temporary. And we all know that a lot can happen in three years. So we should consider this application as scrupulously as any other application, regardless of whether it calls itself temporary or not. And the fact that the applicant has permission to build an office, a garage office already, doesn't um, mean that any building can now be placed anywhere on the site, any type of building uh, for, for temporary purposes. Looking at the report, I agree with the officer's um, identification of the relevant policies in the South Downs local plan, but I disagree very strongly with the conclusions that he reaches as to whether those policies have been complied with. So first of all, strategic policy South Downs 5, which states development proposals will only be permitted where they respect local character through sensitive and high quality design that makes a positive contribution to the overall character and appearance of the area, end quote. The building which is the subject of this application is of an unattractive design. We saw a photograph of it. It's a prefabricated storage container covered in wooden cladding with a flat roof. And it's, it's a, quite a fair size, it's 50 square meters. So it's, it's a, not, a, not a small building by any means. So that does not comply with the South Downs policy. The same policy also states that development proposals will only be permitted where they adopt a landscape-led approach and respect the local character. They should contribute to local distinctiveness and sense of place through their relationship to adjoining buildings, spaces and landscape features." End of quote. The location of this building is clearly inappropriate. It's sited randomly on the far edge of the site, on its own, away from the small cluster of farm buildings, so bearing no relationship with them. I don't agree with the report where it says at 8.12, it's grouped with existing stabling and barn facilities. It might look like that on the plan, but actually when you go and see it in, in real life, it's actually separated from them uh, by, by some uh, considerable distance. Um, that does not comply with the landscape-led requirements of SD4 and 5 of the South Downs plan. Next point, considered cumulatively with all the existing development and extant planning permissions which haven't been carried out yet, including for the garage office, this constitutes overdevelopment in this rural location, affecting in particular tranquility in the park, contrary to South Downs Local Plan um, Policy 7 on tranquility. N the next point, the site is within an international dark skies reserve and strategic policy South Downs 8 seeks to preserve the integrity of dark night skies by requiring that in the first instance, the installation of lighting is avoided. There is going to be external lighting here, two vertically downlit exterior lights. And so it doesn't comply with that policy. And I note that the external, there is to be no external lighting on the permitted garage office. So this is, um, this is going to be lit up, this building. 
And finally, the siting of the building is right on the border with the neighbors' gardens, about maybe about one meter away from the boundary of their gardens. And that is intrusive, given that all the greenery has been cut down. You can see from the photograph that the building extends above the fence that has been erected, and it is overshadowing and dominant of these, of these little tranquil gardens and will have a, a harmful impact on their enjoyment and privacy. Um, and that is contrary to the policy 5K of the South Downs Local Plan, which says the development should avoid harmful impact upon any surrounding uses and amenities. They have 23 acres in all, so why choose this spot right on the boundary with their neighbours' gardens? So in summary, I think we should not as a committee be considering without all due and proper scrutiny a proposal for development within the park just because it purports to be temporary, pending the building out of another building for which permission has been granted. The so-called temporary building should be considered carefully as regards planning policy compliance in its own right. And so for those reasons, I disagree with the officer's recommendation and I'm not intending to support the application. Thank, Thank you. Talk. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've looked at this planning application. I've not been able to go on site, unfortunately. But um, I know the comments that have been made about it doesn't add to the rurality of the, 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 um, the location, which is in a very rural or hamlet. I am particularly concerned at the loss of amenity, which is policy 5K, and at the fact that it's so right on the boundary of the other properties, which, you know, I don't see any reason why it should be there because it impinges on the amenity of the neighbours. Um, I don't understand, um, and possibly um, officers could explain, um, the temporary office is being put in at the same time as a new permitted, develop, new permitted building, or, or isn't it? Um, and I thought there was already an office there or already office facilities in the location if that was the case, why would one want a temporary office? Would the officers care to respond to the two ward members? Hi, sir. My understanding is that the, the offices, the farm is diversified and that the offices is required uh, just for the temporary period until the new offices has been built, which is subject to the other application. Um, in terms of amenity, I think it's clear in the report that for, in our view that it doesn't impact on the adjacent neighbours. It's it's set back from the, the boundary slightly and it's also you've got the existing fence. So in that respect, there's no overlooking and you wouldn't say that that would be reducing any, a farm office reduce any any noise impact. So in, a, in the opinion, it, as stated in the report, we don't feel that there's any significant impact on neighbours there. And um, for the South Downs National Park, that is an important consideration, but you have to consider that this is an existing farm where there are existing buildings and also that it is, it is just a temporary period. And so you have to take into the need of the farm for acquiring the offices, uh, which has to be a consideration and that the, the impact on the South Downs National Park has been minimal in that, in that respect for a temporary period. Um, so drainage, they, they have included details of drainage within the application and that's considered acceptable. Um, but that could be a condition if required necessary. But in our opinion, we, we feel that that's been covered in the submission. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do other, any other members wish to speak? Councillor Noel. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I would just like to uh, say that I, I support everything that Councillor Van der Klift has said. Um, it's... Uh, from from the uh, evidence placed before us by the officers, um, the farm is purely for horse grazing and for hay. Um, the there are other buildings I can see from the plan um, on the farm that would be entirely sufficient for running an office just for this 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 level of administration. So. Um, 
my feeling is that there isn't complete transparency here from the applicant. And um, I just don't understand why this needs to be built even on a temporary basis. I know he's waiting for another office to be built, but whilst they've done this and from the picture, there's a lot of effort gone into uh, cladding it and putting tables outside. It doesn't look like a very temporary one to me. So um, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for the applicant to have an office elsewhere, um, not in the situation which is obviously upsetting everyone else around him. Um, and I, for all the reasons that uh, Councillor van der Kloos has put forward, then um, I will be objecting to this one. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last speaker is Councillor Potts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I don't think the viability for this need has been properly assessed given uh, the sensitivity of its location within the National Park. Um, so the question remains, what is the need um, for this office given the apparent small scale nature of uh, the, the farming operation? Um, for that basis, I, I can't support this either. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to the vote, do the officers wish to say anything further? Um, yes, please, Chairman. Um, I, th I think a, a need for an office is reasonable um, for any scale of, of enterprise, really. Uh, th I think a, an office is reasonable um, and, and an office, the need for that has already been established by the granting of, of, of a permission that has not yet been implemented. Um, the, the development is reasonably small scale um, and in officers' view is unobtrusive. Um, and obviously, you know, even if there are some concerns uh, about its appearance, it, because it, it is a temporary structure, you you can consider it slightly differently. And, and, and that's apparent from condition two, if you look for the reasoning to it. Um, so condition two um, secures the, the temporary period of three years. And it says the reason the proposed development is not considered satisfactory as a permanent measure in accordance with those policies. So officers acknowledge that there is some harm, but because of its limited timescale in which it would be in situ, um, and because a, an office has already been established by a, by a previous permission that has not been implemented, officers consider in this instance, this application is acceptable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would the Democratic Service Officer wish to take, take us to the vote now, please? Yep, okay, so this is voting on the officer recommendation to approve planning permission subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Councillor Blackall. Abstain. Thank you, Councillor Chowan. Uh, reluctant for. Councillor Circus. Again. Councillor Clark. Against. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Against. Thank you. Councillor Croker. Against. Councillor Dorr. Against. Councillor Donnelly. Against. Councillor Jupp. For. Councillor Kitchen. Oh, <coughs> sorry, Paul. I just, I just had to cast my vote in a planning meeting. <laughs> Councillor Jupp? It's all going on today. <laughs> sorry, um, Councillor Kitchen. Or. Thank you. Councillor Lambert. Or. Councillor Morgan. Spain. Councillor Lloyd. Against. Councillor Noll. Against. Councillor Platt. Against. Councillor Potts. Against. Councillor Rowbottom. Against. Councillor Said. Against. Councillor Sanson. Against. Councillor Van der Kloot. Against. Councillor Vickers. Or. And Councillor Wright. Abstain. Thank you. So that was 5 4, 13 against, and three abstentions. So um, that motion has failed. Um, they, they voted against the officer recommendation to approve. Thank you very much. We now go on to agenda item nine, erection of livery stables with associated facilities. And Excuse me. Oh, Excuse me, Chair. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we've refused it, but we haven't, um, we haven't, we have to now have a, a oh, motion. Good a point. Council motion as it's been refused. 
Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Van der Kloof, do you want to do a motion? Yes, I mean, I propose. Um, that it should be refused uh, on the grounds that it's contrary to South Downs local plan policy five. South Downs local plan policy four, South Downs local plan policy seven, and South Downs local plan policy eight, and South Downs local plan policy five little k. And those relate to um, landscape led requirements, design, tranquility, lighting, and um, a harmful impact on um, the use of um, neighboring property. Do you have a seconder? Councillor Clark is second in it. Would you like to take the vote, please? Thank you. So this vote is now for refusal of this application for the reasons stated by Councillor van der Kleet. Councillor Blackall. Abstain. Councillor Chowan. Councillor Chowan. Yeah, sorry. Abstain. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Circus. Um, can I just ask for clarification on this vote? What are we... So this is a vote for the refusal of this application. So if we want to refuse the application... If we you want to four. refuse... Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, four. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Croker. Four. Councillor Dorr. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Jupp. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Lambert. Abstain. Councillor Morgan. Abstain. Councillor Lloyd. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Platt. Four. Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Rowbottom. Four. Councillor Said. Four. Councillor Sanson. Four. Councillor Van der Kloot. Four. Councillor Vickers. Abstain. And Councillor Wright. Abstain. Sorry, Councillor Wright. Sorry, abstain. Thank you. So that is 15, four and six abstentions. So this application has been refused. Right, application refused. Right, let me try again. Can we now move on to agenda item nine, which is the uh, Pulbra erection of livery stables, SOSA facilities, two units of grooms accommodation, machinery store, horse walker, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This was deferred from a previous meeting, and it's in the Hill Farm Barn Lane. Would the officers care to lead? Okay. Right, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, so this application was deferred from September committee. Um, before I start, I've got an amendment to condition 14, which is regarding the use. Uh, the condition will more limit it to state that the stable buildings shall be used only as a private stabling as rented out in full or rented out in full to a single client. So this will limit the use of the property and reduce the, the parking and transport impact as required by the, uh, uh, the highway authority. Okay, so just to remind the uh, councillors of the site, um, here you see the, the site's located west of Cottonmore Hill, adjacent to a number of agricultural buildings to the north, including Coomlands Equestrian Centre. Uh, the red stars on the plan indicate listed buildings, and the purple line indicates an right of way, and South Downs National Park is located to the north and west of this site. So here we have a photo of the existing site. This shows where the, the new stables, proposed stables will are going to go set against the backdrop of the existing building. 
<clears throat> so say is deferred from the 22nd of September committee for the following to be assessed for three things. So impact on the public right of way, assess the South Downs National Park International Dark Skies Reserve impact and assess parking uh, and traffic generation. So on this plan here, this is an amended plan. You can see the green line here uh, represents the right of way. In response to the concerns regarding the impact of the right of way, the amended plan has moved the position of the horse walker, which is the circular building here, further away from the right of way, and also reduced the size of the Western ring of the stables from 12 to 10 units to make it smaller. And so with this reduction, the, uh, we've consulted the uh, rights of way officer and he has no objection to the proposal. So for the impact on the South Downs National Park, South Downs National Park, the SDNP have stated no objection subject to consideration of the Dark Skies Reserve. So in that context, we have a lighting condition uh, recommended part of the landscaping that is uh, specifically put on there to the details of landscape, details of lighting to be submitted as part of the landscaping scheme. And if you remember at the last committee, concern was raised regarding the roof the use of roof lights, which you can see on this plan and the lights they would admit. So the applicant has stated that roof lights are required for natural light. However, he has agreed to a condition which submit details of the blinds for these roof lights, which will include details of a timer uh, to stop any light spill in the, in the nighttime and during um, to when the lights are used. So that in our opinion addressed that, that, uh, that uh, concern. So finally, parking and generation. Um, the Highway Authority have raised an objection as originally consulted, uh, but take into account the, the concerns raised by the committee. Um, they have amended, the applicant has amended and increased the size and number of the six large parking bays and are now proposing 39 spaces, which is an increase, and also increase the separate, separation distance between the rows. Um, they've also submitted a competition log to demonstrate the level activity on events days. And this shows, and they've also shown there's an overspill parking area for parking in the event that this is needed. So overall, we feel that that has been addressed and they've also confirmed the tracking and the county again, the high authority have again confirmed that no objection. So just remind the council of what this would look like. So overall, we feel that the three areas of concern have been addressed and the application is recommended for approval as outlined in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one speaker, uh, the architect, Victoria Holland, will have two minutes on Zoom. Victoria Holland. Hello. Um, on the 21st of September, we made a representation to the planning meeting in support of our application for livery stables at Coomblands. At this meeting, three issues were raised as requiring further detail. Point one, there was concern that the location of the stables in relation to the footpath could result in dogs frightening the horses. Although we think this unlikely, we have nevertheless reduced the length of the west wing of the stables and have relocated the horse walker three metres further away. Since then, the public rights of way officer has in fact confirmed that the footpath in question is not actually a public right of way and that the nearest one is actually some 15 metres away. Point two, the presence of roof lights on the roof of the stables was raised as a contravention of the dark skies policy. Our intention is to provide the horses with both natural light and natural ventilation. The positioning of the roof lights in order to bring natural light into the centre of the stables is a common feature of the American barn and a sustainable approach to maximising natural light. Should any background lighting be required at night, the levels would be kept to a minimum. If the roof lights are still a concern, the, the owner is happy to consider automatic blackout blinds. Although this isn't particularly desirable owing to the electricity consumption by the motors, it certainly wouldn't be ruled out as an option. Point three, there were concerns raised that the proposed car parking would be insufficient. Our client has therefore in detail described how the centre operates and the fact that when an event is taking place, only a limited number of contestants will be present. There are unlikely to be more than 25 horse boxes parked at any one time. It should also be noted that the new livery stables will be supervised by a single livery professional and not individual ones. This person will live on site and therefore will generate minimal traffic movements themselves. In total recognition of this concern, however, the parking provision has now been increased to a total of 39 spaces and each space increased in size to allow for optimum 
uh, manoeuvrability and also for larger horse, bo horse boxes. Um, we should be very grateful of the committee's support. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria Holland. Councillor Clark. Hi, John. Before I, before I comment, um, could I ask, or would it be possible for the officer to put back up the site diagram? Because I think the site diagram is in error. Um, I also note the comment that was made about the lie of the footpath, but can you can we just have a look at where the footpath lies? Because I think it's people will get the wrong idea. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, the point. The plan. Right. Thank you. The point about the foot is that you've indicated the, the footpath running from right to left is incorrect. In fact, it rise, there is a, a, a brown line or an orange, there is a line above it heading diagonally up towards the intersection with the other footpath. That is the path of the footpath. If I walk that area very often every week, that this diagram is incorrect. Um, to make my comments, thank you for allowing, there we are. You can see the line there of the footpath running up diagonally across, that is the existing footpath as people walk it and as the signposts have it. I find this one now very difficult. It was clear last time, this time it's more difficult because the, the horse walk has been moved um, away from the footpath. Um, I hear the comments about dogs and horses. Well, my personal experience of horses and dogs is they don't mix particularly. Um, and I'm also glad that the leg, if I can put it this way, has been shortened somewhat. Um, so the main points that I had concerns about have been allayed or addressed, and for that I'm very grateful to the applicant and, and to the officers for working on it. I still have, a, as cabinet member for economic development, I should be overjoyed um, at the expansion of the business and um, more business into the area. And in theory, as cabinet member for economic development, I am. But as a local member and knowing that area so well, um, I hear the, uh, the discussions and the arguments from officers about expanding the car parking um, and um, um, putting in more facilities for the car parking. And I am, I am still not convinced. The point is, I, I have lived with that Cummins area now that I've been living in this village for over 12 years. In the summer, Vehicles spill all over the place for these competitions. And I hear what was said about logs and stuff, but what's happening today is vehicles are parking over that development. Now, I acknowledge the car park's been extended, but I am not convinced. If you look at the horse boxes going up there, it's not rinky-dink little three or four or five meter horse boxes. You have a large number of HGV type vehicles going up there, discharging two or three or four horses. Um, I appreciate that the officers have done their best to take it forward and to expand on it and work with the applicant. Um, I'm likely to abstain on this one because I mean, most of the points have been um, addressed, but I am still not convinced about the traffic flows. Um, if a traffic flow condition can be put in or something to tighten up on the parking and on the vehicles using the car park, I'd be grateful if somebody could think up with something. Thank you. Do your officers wish to comment? Um, well, you take those take those points on board, but as as originally submitted, it was considered acceptable in terms of highways. So and now it's been approved, and more information has been submitted to show that uh, that the tracking is acceptable. Um, the only thing I can I can I can think of is um, we can condition it further for if it's regarding the events, you can ask for an events management plan to be submitted to cover that aspect. If you if the council thinks that's appropriate. It would be perfectly acceptable to to require that by condition. Right, we'll come back to that, I guess. Councillor Rowbottom. Thank you. Just a bit of um, clarification, please, Jason. I'm sure that to start with, you said that this was for private use only, for personal use only. I think you said, but then the agent talks about liveries, so. Can, can you have both, I mean, together? Um, surely, if people have horses at livery there, they're going to be in and out all the time to see them. 
but I think I'm sure you said something at all about but being for personal use only. Can you please clarify that? Yes, as um, it was raised by the uh, the highways regarding the the highways impact. So they and it was also in in line with what they've suggested in their application that the stables building should only be used for private stabling by the owners themselves or rented out in full for a single client. So I know that's a bit confusing, but what I mean is it won't be open for general commercial use. It won't, you won't have individual users in each stables. So you'll either have these two, you'll either have the stable, the owners using it or, or rent the whole thing out for a single use. So that will, it won't be like a, a, a normal livery when you have each individual stable being rented out. So that was a requirement from um, the, the highways team to reduce the, the highway impacts. And also it's, it's in line with their submission. So but that didn't, makes sense. did the agent say something about being liveries? Well, it is, it is a livery, I suppose, but it's, uh, it's really who uses it. So it depends what your, your definition of livery is, I suppose. But it, we, as I said, we'd be imposing that condition as required by the highways. So that will limit the use. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lloyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, I think this is a very good design. Um, so, and uh, they've also addressed all the, well, I think they've addressed quite well the issues that were raised at the last meeting. But um, Councillor Clark has already uh, voiced his concerns over access and parking. And I, these are my concerns as well. Um, on event days in particular, I think there'll be significant access issues to the, to the uh, lane and to the main road with the, um, tra with the trailers. And these uh, has already been pointed out, very large horse, horse boxes being stacked up and blocking access to the farm and also to the lane. Uh, the fact that the uh, applicant has allowed for an overflow car park is a clear indication, in my view, that uh, significant numbers of people are expected to, to attend these events. And I'm, I'm skeptical about the time people will spend on site. I think they mentioned two hours. And it's my view from experience having attended these events before that these people come for, for the whole day. So uh, in view of this, if members are minded to, um, to approve the application. Uh, I would like to see a condition included for a traffic management plan uh, to cover the management of traffic uh, and the access uh, from the main road to the lane and from the lane into the new access road to prevent any, uh, any restriction of access into the farm and obviously any blockage in the main road. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have three speakers and they'll be the last speakers ending with Councillor Vickers. We'll go to Councillor Jupp, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I agree with Councillor Rowbottom's query. There seems to be a, a conflict between uh, what we believe to be livery stables, which means that people keep their horses there and they go and see them every morning or evening or weekend, and what we were told about just one private operator. The private operator will probably then sublet them to all the different uh, owners of those horses. So I think that needs to be clarified because that impacts on the concerns of both Councillor Clark and Councillor Lloyd. Thank you. Do officers wish to respond on that again? Um, well, we could expand on the condition. So there's a like, uh, recommending condition that the stable shall only be used as private stabling or rented out in single to a to or rent out and fall to a single client so we could expand that to say that it shan't they shan't be rented out to to individuals in their own so we could expand the condition out to make it clear uh, that that, that uh, the the concern that council job has won't won't occur um, if I could just add to that, an another option would be to delegate approval to, to me in consultation with local members and the chair and vice chair um, to to um, finalise conditions relating to to the limitations on the use of the stables and also the, the details of the condition relating to the traffic management plan and events plan if members wish to add those conditions on. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. So thank you. We, we will take that on board and I think agree that. Councillor No. Thank you, Chairman. I should be very brief. Um, in addition to the concerns that uh, councillors have already voiced in relation to this application, 
I uh, would like to add a further concern which I have about uh, lighting. It's only a kilometre away from the border of the National Park. Um, the dark skies, as I mentioned at the last time uh, this, this application came before us, um, the dark skies policy requires a penumbra which actually uh, has got to extend more than a kilometre away from the border of the, of, of the park. And it, the, 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 the application mentions events in various different places, and obviously there are going to be events here, otherwise there'd be no point in putting this proposal forward in the first place. Uh, I'm concerned that, especially at this time of year, it gets dark well before any event would finish, so therefore they would be using floodlights, although I know most uh, horse riding events take place in the summer. However, the floodlights would be affecting the dark skies policy of the South Downs National Park, and that leads for me to have very significant concerns. And I would like to see conditions prohibiting lighting, any flood lighting after dark. Thank you. Councillor Vickers. Chairman, without wanting to pr prolong this any longer, I think we've had a really good debate. This was a long discussion last time. I thank the officers for getting the amendments that were required, moving the horse walker and reducing the uh, Western um, part of the livery stable has sincerely helped the, um, the footpath area. Uh, I share the concerns about parking, but I think the traffic management plan will help to assist that. Um, and I think delegation, delegating this with a view to approval in consultation with the local members and the chairman and vice chairman of this committee um, is a good way forward um, to make sure that the, uh, the actual um, single client part is, is covered. So on that basis, I should be supporting the officer's recommendation with those extra conditions. Thank you. Here in development, do you need here to uh, make a, uh, a new motion to, no, we just, the motion will just be worded under, de uh, to be delegated, will it? I think it would be beneficial if there was a motion to, to delegate and that's just seconded. Um, and I just wanted to comment quickly with regard to Councillor Noel. Um, condition 18 um, uh, advises no, no external lighting. Um, but but obviously, if it's delegated for approval, that's something that that local members in the chair and vice chair can consider in any event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Clark, would you like to uh, propose? Thank you, Chairman. I would like to propose um, that we um, accept this application with the conditions that um, the head of development has suggested to do with local members and to tighten up on the parking and the other bits and pieces that she's mentioned previously. Is there a seconder? German, can I just confirm that we're delegating this for approval subject to those conditions yes. in consultation? That's all. Yes. I think that's what Councillor Clark's saying. Yes. That's no, what no. I tried to say. Yeah, yeah thank, approval, you. But, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Delegation to the gang, to use the technical expression. I see the monitoring officer watch me. Everybody happy there? Right. Okay. Would the Democratic Service Officer like to take us through the vote, please? Yeah, so this is a vote um, to delegate, delegate for approval um, by the Head of Development with consultation um, with the local members and the Chair and Vice Chairman of this committee. So, Councillor Blackall. For. Councillor Chowan. Uh, I missed a bit of it, so I can't vote. Thank you. Councillor Circus. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Croker. Abstain. Councillor Daw. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Jupp. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Lambert. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Lloyd. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Platt. Same. Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Rowbottom. Four. Councillor Said. Four. Councillor Sanson. Four. Councillor Vanderkloot. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. And Councillor Wright. Four. Thank you. So that's 18 4 and 3 abstentions. So that motion has been carried. 
Thank you very much. You possibly have seen the note from the monitoring officer that the training session for 5.30 has been cancelled because of the overrun here. Right. Agenda item 10, retrospective application for the retention of roof-mounted solar panels, New Spinney, West Chiltington. The applicant is Councillor Saeed, and he will now leave the meeting. Has he left the meeting? Yes, he is now in the waiting room. Thank you very much. Would the officers uh, care to present? Okay, uh, so an application retention of roof mounted roof lights. Here we can see the location plan relates to a detached property in the northeast, north side of Spinney Lane in West Chiltington. This roof plan here shows the uh, roof, light, roof lights in, in place. You've got three to the west elevation, separated by a chimney and 12 to the to east, uh, which includes uh, roof lights to the to a garage. So it says this is retrospective, so the roof lights are in place. So here you see the, the west elevation, the east elevation, sorry, with the roof lights on the on the roofs open, also on the garage. And here you see the, the roof lights, less roof lights on the west elevation. So overall, we feel that this application is acceptable. Uh, we feel that the impact on the appearance of the dwelling is appropriate, as well as the impact on adjacent properties. And that takes into account policy 36, which requires development to minimize its energy use. So overall, we feel this is, this is an appropriate development. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one speaker, David Self, who is objecting and is coming to us by Application DC20-1547. I am specifically objecting to the solar panels fitted to the roof of the garage, which as you can see from behind me, and because of the topography of the lane, are less than one metre above my garden and less than one metre from my boundary. They are visible when sitting on my settee in the living room and dominate the frontage of the property significantly, detracting from the amenity of a Wells cottage. The conservation officer agrees that they are conspicuously placed and do undermine opportunities to appreciate the adjoining property. He goes on further to say that a work <coughs> would be considered as a non-designated heritage asset and these panels do not minimise the effect on the amenity. A planning officer states that schemes will also need to ensure that they do not have a significant adverse effect on landscape, character or cultural assets. Obviously, as you can see from behind me, they absolutely do. Furthermore, the planning officer states that the effect of an application on the significance of a non-designated heritage asset should be taken into account. A technical error within the report is that solar panels absorb sunlight. This is factually incorrect. They absorb ultraviolet light and as such are highly reflective. The officer states they are not best sighted for solar gain and would work better on the south elevation Therefore, the planning office report is flawed and inaccurate. Approval would also set the precedent for panels to be installed in front gardens, as that is the reality of what these are on the garage roof. These panels could be recited on the south elevation of the main house, or indeed on a frame support in the valley on the other side of the garage roof, being then in the same orientation as they are now. Therefore, with the condition that the panels are recited, this approval could be passed. Thank you, Mr. Self. Do the officers wish to comment at this stage? Uh, yes, I mean, I can take it, they take those points on board, um, but we still feel that this is an appropriate application. They can be seen from the neighbouring property, but that in itself is not a reason to, to refuse. It has to be an assessment of whether they detrimentally impact on, the, on his amenity and uh, whether they're appropriate in terms of the visual impact. And as outlined approach, the report, we feel that, that this scheme is uh, appropriate in both those, both those uh, contexts. Thank you. Go to the local members, Council, uh, Councillor Blackwell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I object to this um, uh, application on the following grounds. One is that we have a very strong uh, report by the conservation officer on the unsuitability of, of this. This is borne out by uh, Mr. Self, who has just uh, made a very good presentation on 
the obtrusive nature of these solar panels. And it's also backed up by the parish council who object to this. I'm also objected that I you know, do not like to be presented with almost a fait accompli with these uh, um, retrospective planning permissions. So I would urge that we actually vote against this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Circus. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have to say, there seems to be, um, how can I put this? Uh, well, I won't use a pejorative term. I'll just simply say there is a difference. There's a difference between what Jason has just been telling us and what the conservation officer says. I, I, I think perhaps it, it might be a good idea First of all, to say that th this is an object lesson for all councillors, um, particularly new councillors, although, although um, Jack Saeed had experience previously at Worthing, is um, how important it is if you're going to do any work on your properties to ask the officers uh, whether there's any permission needed. It's a good practice. And then when the officers say, if they say that no permission is needed, it's not a bad idea to get that in writing, because all of us who have any sort of public position, uh, we are potential targets. Um, nobody is saying that it is wrong for the applicant to want to uh, gain the advantage of green energy. This is not the concerns that my colleague uh, ha has raised are not opposition to green energy. And how could I, as the cabinet member for the environment, be against green energy? Uh, but it is uh, about the placing of these particular panels. And you can see from paragraph 3.2, and I'd refer members to what the uh, conservation officers said, I agree that they are conspicuously placed and do undermine opportunities to appreciate the adjacent pixies and blue cedar, both being Wells cottages. Um, now, uh, the, the fact is that uh, in other areas, uh, these lanes in West Chiltington uh, would either be designated as what's called a RASC, a residential area of special character, um, or they would be, the Wells Cottages that is, would be locally listed. If you take the village of East Horsley in, in Surrey, um, there are houses that are not dissimilar in design, and East Horsley is famous for these houses. And Guildford Borough Council, which is the local authority, has locally listed all of those buildings. So other local authorities have given uh, the protection to the character of, of these lanes and the world's cottages. Uh, and despite um, my having raised this over, ever since I became a councillor, we haven't managed to do it in, in Horsham, but other local authorities would. Um, so uh, the issue is really the, um, the placing of these, these panels. And what worries me is this. Um, if, if, we, if the committee approves this application, when the conservation officer and the parish council have said uh, that this is an, these are inappropriately placed, because that's essentially what the conservation officer, I think, is saying, then you're setting a precedent. And that is going to make it difficult for council officers to refuse inappropriate placing of panels on other properties. And remember that although there is permitted development rights in relation to the site of the uh, placing of these panels, uh, but it, it is subject to a condition uh, does, that the 
citing does not minimize, uh, it doesn't cause problems uh, for neighboring properties and the amenity of neighboring properties, uh, which this clearly does. And so uh, to approve this would be creating a precedent that would make it difficult for the officers to reject other applications where the panels have been inappropriately placed. If, however, the, the officers were decided to regard this as an exceptional case, and I'm not quite sure I know on what basis they would do that, uh, then what you will get is you will get the situation where people will say, yes, well, we inappropriate, quote, inappropriately placed the panels on our roof. We got rejected by officers at Horsham, but then of course, this was granted uh, in this particular case we're looking at now, but then he was a councillor. So you can see the potential damage that can be done to the reputation of the council and the reputation of councillors. I think it would be much more sensible to recognise that it's appropriate, uh, quite appropriate for Jack Saeed to want to uh, take advantage of green energy, uh, but as, as the conservation officer says, quite clearly that's the implication of what he says, this is inappropriately cited. And therefore, it seems to me that what should we should do, and I'm going to ask the officers whether this can be done, can we delay or adjourn consideration of this to see whether the applicant uh, is prepared in consultation with the officers to rearrange the placing of these panels so that uh, he gets the advantage of green energy, uh, but the, the uh, placing of the panels does not cause the, the, the grief that it has caused, uh, and, and understandably so, uh, with neighbouring properties, uh, and can get the blessing of the council's conservation officer. Now, if the answer is that that can't be done, then with regret, uh, I, I have to say, I cannot support this application this afternoon. But maybe the, uh, the officers uh, can tell us whether uh, it, it is feasible to think about adjourning this application uh, to see whether more ap uh, appropriate citing uh, could be involved uh, and the objections that have been raised uh, could be ameliorated. Thank you, Chairman. Head of development. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first off, just to say, um, as with any application, the comments from consultees such as the, the conservation officer form part of the officer's assessment. Um, but, you know, there, there are a number of considerations in, in coming to a conclusion, and that's not solely based on, on the views of the conservation officer. Um, in this instance, the benefits of, of the renewable energy um, and, and the fact that there's no impact on, on neighbours, etc., forms part of that assessment and officers consider it to be acceptable. And just because you can see something doesn't mean that it's unacceptable. There, there would need to be demonstrable harm um, to, to, to raise um, an objection to it. Um, most uh, solar panels don't require planning permission. Um, it's a matter of fact and degree as to whether they do. Um, and in and this instance, an application was, was invited on balance and, and submitted. Um, in terms of a deferral, um, the difficulty is, is what's being suggested through a deferral is a fundamental change to the scheme. Um, so my, my advice would be we, we should proceed with a decision, um, but it is open to members to, 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 to seek a deferral to see whether, whether they can be changed. But, but obviously that's a very different proposal than, than what's before us. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate to, to add a condition, I think, as was mentioned by a speaker, um, because that, that again, that's not the proposal before us. It would be up to the applicant if they choose to, to change the scheme, which we can ask them by deferral. Thank you. Councillor Vickers. Thank you, Chairman. Um, we need to be mindful of the requirement to use renewable energy and reduce our carbon footprint. So from that perspective, I welcome this. But I absolutely support the view that there is some harm on the um, neighbour 
um, and I would like a deferral so we can go back and ask him to mm. move them. If not, I think we should refuse it. So I'm I'm either, mm. easy either way. Either we um, go for a deferral to ask the applicant to move those panels onto the perhaps the southern elevation rather than the ones closest to the neighbour's garden. Um, but if he isn't prepared to do that, I think we should refuse it. So um, I'm happy either way, whichever proposal is more acceptable. Thank you. Do there any other members wish to speak? No, mother, no other members wish to speak. Does the, would the Head of Development like to respond to Councillor Vicar's comments? Um, if members wish to put forward an alternative motion to defer, then, then that's open for them to, to do so and, and, and that could be voted on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to defer this to try and get a satisfactory solution. But if it can't be <clears throat> agreed with the uh, applicant, then it needs to come back and we can decide then to refuse it. I'm happy to ask for a deferral if somebody Maybe. will second me. Can I just? I, yeah. I would second that, Chair. Uh, Councillor Crocker wanted to come. Crocker wanted to come in. You'd like to make a quick comment? It was only just to say I'd second that proposal to defer. Uh, Okay, so sorry to interrupt. Start again, Councillor Vickers. You're making a proposal now. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I suggest we defer a decision so the officers can go away and ask the applicant to move those panels that are causing the most concern. And if he's not prepared to do that, we'll bring it back to committee and then the committee can decide whether they want to refuse. Thank you. Councillor Circus, I need to give a second. Councillor Circus, you second? Just Yes, well, I'm happy to second. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Can we go to the vote? Oh, sorry, hang on. Councillor Lloyd, have you got your hand up, Councillor Lloyd? Are oh, you just waving to me? That's okay, that's nice. Thank you. Right, maybe go to the vote. Okay, so this is a vote for the deferral of this application. Um, Councillor Blackall. Four. Councillor Chowan. Four. Councillor Circus. Four. Councillor Clark. Yes. Councillor Croker. Four. Councillor Dorr. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Jupp. Four. Councillor Kitchen. She's gone. She's gone. <gasps> okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Lambert. Four. Councillor Morgan. <coughs> Councillor Lloyd. Four. Councillor Noel. Councillor Noel. That was a four. Thank you very much. Councillor Platt. <coughs> four. Thank you, Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Rowbottom. Four. Councillor, uh, sorry, Councillor Sanson. Four. Councillor Van der Kloot. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. And Councillor Wright. Four. Thank you. That is 18-4, one, one against and no abstentions. So this uh, application has been deferred. <coughs> Thank you. Can I just ask, as a point of information, um, who will be involved in these discussions? I, um, will, will this be the officers? Will you be involved, Chairman? No, yeah. be the officers. Local members. I don't think so. I think just the officers would be. Okay. Generally, it would be the officers, but I think it would be beneficial if, if we had a conversation with, with local members as well. Okay, you're happy with that. Yeah, Thank you I, very it, much. it doesn't form part of the resolution, but um, it, yeah. it's good to keep you updated anyway. Yeah, thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Right. Where are we in our um... horses? Sorry. Right. Agenda item 11. Direction of a stable block, land south of East Street Farm, etc., etc., has come up very quickly. Amberley, thank you very much. Okay, right. Uh, is that uh, going to work? 
Okay, so it'll be a very um, quick one. So this is a county, this is a, sorry, Horsham District Council scheme. Um, with new stables, if we go to the site, there's a field to the south of E Street at Ambley. Uh, Ambley includes a conservation area, so this will be adjacent to the conservation area. It also includes a number of listed buildings, which I've highlighted in blue, in the blue circles. And I've also shown indicatively where the stables will be. So this is a picture of the site and I've indicatively shown there where the new stables will be on the, on the field. So here we see the floor plans elevations. It has been demonstrated that there's a need for these stables. And we also, as our land report, feel it's the scheme's appropriate in terms of its siting, the impact on the setting of the conservation area and this building. So the after scheme is recommended for approval as outlined in, outlined in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are no public speakers. I'll go to the ward members, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chairman. I have no comments to make. I think the law seems fine. Councillor Van de Kluch. Um, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> um, I just had one point, and that was there seems to be some confusion about the sighting of the um, of the stables, and I did raise this with officers before the meeting. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the um, the plan, put it, well, <laughs> nobody can because I've, I've got them in front of me, but the plan put in by the applicant shows the sighting of the stables to be <clears throat> in a different place from the plan that was just put up by the officer, which shows the stables to be sighted um, on the boundary of Wisteria Cottage's garden. And that's not where I understand the applicant to be asking for the stables to be. And, and I did ask for clarification of that before the meeting. And I was told that the officer's plan was incorrect, the one we've just looked at. And that if you could put it up again, please, and we can establish where the stables are meant to be going. Okay, yeah, sorry. I mean, um, I can show you the, the block plan that was submitted as part of the application, which will be the, the approved plan. So you just bear with me. Can you see that? Yep. Yep. There's so that, that that will be the, the approved plan showing the position of the of the, the stables. Yeah, and can you just show with your highlighter wh where the plan was, where it was on the previous plan? It was up higher near Wisteria Cottage's garden. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I that was, uh, I did get that from the committee report. So um, I apologize if that wasn't quite correct. Yes, that's a committee report plan. Yeah. So that one, no, they, yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. Correct. Right. Yes. So the the plan I showed you before would be the um would be the approved plan. The one where it's more, more to the south. Yes. There you go. That one. Thank you. Okay. Um. Well, thank you for clarifying that, and provided that is made quite clear, um, in the in the permission, I've got no objections to this application. Thank you. Yes. Apologies for that. You know, can confirm this will be the, the approved plan for the layout. Thank you. Right, we have Councillor Jupp wishes to speak. Councillor Jupp. It was it was only to advise you that I may have to leave before the end of this particular topic. It's now uh, five to six and we started at 2.30 and I have another meeting to go to. That was all, thank you. Yes, we, we, I think we're gonna close off quickly now. Are there any other parties who wish to speak? Nobody wishes to speak. Anything else the officers wish to say? Nothing further from the officers. Maybe go to the vote, please, Democratic Services. Yep. Okay. So this vote is for the officer recommendation to approve planning permission uh, subject to the conditions as set out in the report. Councillor Blackhall. Four. Councillor Chowan. Four. Councillor Circus. Four. Councillor Clark. Four. Councillor Croker. Four. Councillor Dorr. Four. Councillor Donnelly. Four. Councillor Jupp. Four. Councillor Kitchen. Four. Councillor Lambert. Four. Councillor Morgan. Four. Councillor Lloyd. Four. Councillor Noel. Four. Councillor Platt. Four. Councillor Potts. Four. Councillor Rowbottom. Four. 
Councillor Said. Four. Councillor Sanson. Four. Councillor Van der Kloot. Four. Councillor Vickers. Four. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Four. Thank you. Um, so that is unanimous four. So the planning application has been approved. Well, thank you very much. Item 12, urgent business. There's none other than to go to the loo or the fridge. And I do thank you all for your, your patience over this long meeting. I think it was some very good debate. And as we know, planning meetings like a piece of string, you never know how long it really is. So thank you very much. And I wish Councillor Jock all the best at his next meeting. And good night. Chairman, can I just say that um, the planning um, training that's been cancelled this evening, if you can make it to the next one on Monday at 4 p.m., great. If not, we'll um, try and find an alternative. But obviously, it's going to be tricky. We'll come thank back to you all. But thank you yeah. all very much. That's a good point. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, thank you. Good night everybody.